So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to all of you tropical foresters and interested in forestry. Uh, we are about to start our webinar session today uh, on tropical restoration, reforestation, pros and cons. Uh, I'm gonna give a little bit of instructions before we start. Uh, we are gonna be able to answer questions some of them might be answered as people speak. Some of them are gonna be answered after each presentation. And most of all, at the end, we wanna have your questions for panelists so we can address them at the end where we have about an hour uh, of, of discussion. So each presenter is gonna have 15 minutes for their presentation and, and they're gonna have a couple minutes for questions and answers. So if you wanna have a question answer, make sure that you post your question on the on the question and answer and, and the host and the panelists will be able to address them. Uh, there, the chat feature is not available, unfortunately, and the raise hand is not gonna be available. So the only way that you can speak to us is through questions and answers. So please make sure that you, you type to who do you wanna direct your questions so we can better redirect you uh, the answers back. And, and, and when you mention your question also, Mention, you know, if you don't mind mentioning your name of your organization, that will be great. So we know who's, who, who is inquiring. So I'm gonna go ahead and the, the, the presentations are gonna be presented using a video for each presentation. That way we make sure that, because we have people from different parts of the world, that if there's problems with the internet or with their reception, that we can still broadcast their presentation. So you will gonna be seeing a video of each presentation and also to let you know that everything is gonna be recorded and we're gonna be able to post it in the International Society of Tropical Foresters website. Uh, first, I'm gonna introduce you with Sheila Ward. Dr. Sheila Ward is the Executive Director of the International Society of Tropical Foresters and she's gonna be giving the introduction of the event. Um, can you... Um put my video on. Yes. Welcome to the Symposium on Tropical Restoration and Reforestation Pros and Cons. The sponsoring organizations for this symposium are the International Society of Tropical Foresters, the International Forestry Working Group of the Society of American Foresters and Terraformation. And I'm Sheila Ward, and I am with the International Society of Tropical Foresters and the S Society of American Foresters. The International Society of Tropical Foresters, for more information, check out the website at tropicalforesters.org. For membership inquiries, send a message to tropicalforesters at gmail.com. Um, for the Society of American Foresters, the website is www.eforester.org. For membership, check out the webpage indicated here. Now, if you are an SAF member and you would like to get a CFE credits for this symposium, please send your name and SAF membership number to robert.sturdevant at colostate.edu, and we will have this information in the chat or Q&A for you later. Last but not least, Terraformation, a business um, devoted to deploying scalable tools to restore Earth's forests and capture more carbon using seed banks, nurseries, and software and training in how to deploy these. Their website is www.terraformation.com, and we're very grateful to them today for helping us mount the Zoom um, for this meeting. Disclaimer, the purpose of this symposium is to foment discussion and sharpen our thinking on how to approach tropical restoration and reforestation. The opinions expressed in this symposium do not necessarily represent the positions of the sponsoring organizations. So well, thank you very much, Sheila. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first presenter, who's Dr. Tom Larry. 
Tom Gary, I'm sorry. Tom Gary is a retired forest scientist with the USDA Forest Service in the United States. And his presentation today, he's gonna to be giving us the introduction to the symposium, pros and cons of tropical reforest, reforestation and restoration. I'll leave you with Tom. Hello, uh, I'm Tom Geary. My presentation today is an introduction to the pros and cons of tropical restoration and reforestation. I came to this because I became the long about global warming. And that started me thinking about the role of trees and forests in solving the problem. And that led me to read a book written by Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft Corporation. In this book, How to Avoid a Climate uh, Disaster, the solutions we have and the breakthroughs we need, I had hoped to find out how trees would be part of the solution. But Gates is not enthusiastic about trees as a solution. Exclamation point. Uh, building on my personal experience in search of the literature, uh, I side with Gates. And I'm going to tell you what I think and why I think it. As caveats, I am speaking about trees whose main purpose is carbon storage. And I am accepting a Gates view that we need to reduce greenhouse gases emissions to zero until the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere returns to that for the three industrial areas. That is emissions to zero. I believe I'm qualified to uh, talk on this subject. I've done research on tree planting for commercial wood production and um, bio -en biomass energy. I've done research on controlling in invasive tree species. I work with the US government uh, on, in technical assistance and research cooperation with other countries. And most of the experience was in the tropics. The book by Gil Gates is challenging the useful of trees planting and forest to mitigate climate change. In the title of his book, um, The Solutions We Have and the Breakthroughs We Need. And I just point out Gil Gates is co-founder of Microsoft Corporation. In this case, I'm wondering who he was. That I don't that doesn't really make him authority on the subject, but I think he's pretty good. Uh, and Gates is not optimistic about trees as one of the solutions. And again, Gates' goal to avoid a disaster is reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to the level of the pre-industrial era. Now, the question is, what I've read is, does it apply to tropical restoration and reforestation? This book is about the problem of global warming, but the tropics are linked to that. They're in fact a major component of, of why the Globe is warming. Uh, Gates does not include planting trees for aesthetic and other environmental benefits in his skepticism. Uh, those living in the tropics can decide if his views fit their situation. I mean, look out your window and see if it's what he's saying actually applies to you. I think, but I do think concerns Gates raises that tree survival and forest preservation apply to most regions and tree uses. An exception may be industrial wood plantations. Now, here's some points I'm going to cover. Well, accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, forces global warming. I think we can say it's highly probable that is a true statement. However, I would do as an aside. Uh, there are natural forces that are also at play, and it's unsettled how much they contribute to warming. We are in an interglacial period of the Ice Age. And warming sea level rise and glacial retreat is going on for several thousand years. Uh, but it's not as been a straight linear increase. Uh, there have been lot of periods, long periods of higher level cooking of warming, and then there have been some pretty extensive cooling periods. And the question is now, which way is the switch? Is it on for warming or cooling? And I think just leave that discussion to uh, physicists to work out. Uh, we take carbon dioxide, a major greenhouse gas, out of the atmosphere and store the carbon. We know uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, tree planting seems a good idea for removing carbon dioxide, but has problems. Natural regeneration often seems a better option, but also has problems. 
Uh, preserving the existing store of carbon in existing forests is ideal, but will be difficult. Now let's look at tree planting according to Gates. Uh, planting trees to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is cheap and low tech. It has appeal, but the effect in global warming is overblown. That's what he says. He says the effect is overblown. And he gives an example that's really related to how much carbon is in the forest store. Um, U.S. example, 20 hectares of highly productive land is needed to absorb the emissions of an average American in their lifetime. And if you multiply by the number of Americans, you're using half of the world's land mass. Uh, big caveat here, trees planted for carbon storage must survive for a long time. If trees would grow naturally in planting areas, no extra carbon storage is needed. I'm not talking about going to talk about direct seeding for restoration. Um, I think the survival problem is there, but I, I understand that there's research going on and advances that uh, may get around some of those problems, but it's still a challenge. Now, here's some of the problematic stuff. Um, it is one thing to plant a tree and another have the tree survive to fulfill the proposed function. And I would um, say that's worth repeating. It's, it is one thing to plant a tree and another to have the tree survive to the proposed function. A one credit card company will plant a tree to cover your carbon footprints every time you use the card. That's a feel good thing to do. But will the tree survive to fulfill the promise? The only promoted option is purchasing planted trees or existing forests as carbon emission offsets. But will the trees and forests survive? If not, can the carbon credit be canceled and the purchasers get their money back? In other words, uh, what is the guarantee and who is policing this? And unfortunately, a little more negative on tree planting. I, I know of large scale tree planting that failed. And one is the reason is people were paid to plant trees but not keep them alive. And another was planting was done in the wrong place for the wrong reason. And I think really the more of the point is there's a recent publication by Forrest Fleischman and 14 others that is and it's negative, like Gates. The publication's title is Pitfalls of Tree Planting Show Why We Need People-Centered Natural Solutions. And well, Fleischman's pitfalls, uh, they list 11, that is 11 in detail, and you have to get the publication to go into what they are. The bottom line is, uh, they believe that policymakers are convinced that massive campaign plant trees should be an element of global climate policy. Uh, but they say the benefits are emphasized, but the pitfalls are downplayed. They say avoid the expense, risk, and damage of poorly designed and hastily implemented tree planting uh, and, and impose that on ecosystems and people. Let's look at natural regeneration. Natural regeneration to produce a carbon bar storage forest seems a great idea. Let nature take its course and reestablish forests. Gates favors it over tree planting. And I have wondered many times why trees are being planted on deforested land when natural regeneration would do it. And here's some things in favor of natural regeneration. There are good examples, at least. In the eastern part of the United States, this was completely deforested. Now it is heavily forested, mainly by natural regeneration. And a recent report on the study of planting trees on abandoned farmland in the U.S. state of Maryland had an unexpected result. The trees growing the best came up from rootstocks and seeds that are in the soil. So uh, natural regeneration is cheaper than planting and uses less fossil fuels in establishment. And I think that's important. People really had to consider when they're doing the project how much fossil fuel they're using. They're trying to eliminate using fossil fuels. Um, you know, the con of natural regeneration. Uh, that basically it's a difficulty in preserving the regrown forest. Young trees are easy to cut down than old forests. Second growth forests in the Amazon typically only last five to eight years. In Costa Rica, um, reforest. Okay, the difficulty of preserving the regrown forest, young forests easily cut down the old forests, second growth forests in 
The Amazon typically lasts only five to eight years. In Costa Rica, a reforestation champion, half of regrowing forests fall within 20 years. Basically, regenerating forests means the same peril as established forests. Well, let's look at preserving existing forests for carbon capture. Uh, Gates says the most effective tree related strategy is preserve the trees we already have. And why? Well, good example of environmental defense fund report. Tropical deforestation contributes 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so the greatest forest problem really is protecting existing forests. And here are some of the woes. There's a few examples, not necessarily all related to the tropics, but the tropical forests are being felled by agriculture at a rapid pace. And one thing is 3 billion more people will have by the end of the century. And this is going to increase loss, um, particularly for agricultural land. And massive fires and temperate boreal forests are really news. Here in the US, we have native and alien pests are killing many trees. So how to deal with all these breaks, um, it does go through breakthroughs are needed. One, he says, the cost of clean energy, electric power storage, and carbon capture must be reduced to compete with fossil fuels. In other words, to get to zero emissions. And he says, the current technology is not sufficient to get to zero emissions. Gates lists 19 technologies needed. And no forestry technologies are directly stated. And end note is hope these thoughts are fuel for heated discussion, but this is not exactly the end note of one week bring to you. Um, if you're interested in the references I use, you can look in the report by Thomas uh, Geary in the ISD newsletter for April 22. This presentation is based on that report. And you might add um, the paper by Asner uh, in called Measuring Carbon Emissions for Tropical Deforestation and Overview. It's an environmental defense fund report. And I think you should be able to find it by just, you know, Go to the edf.org website. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And we still got a couple more questions, a couple more minutes for questions. Uh, we have Tom in here. If anybody has any questions that we, we can read out loud to him, please feel, feel free to share them on the questions and answers. So if we don't have any any questions, I'm gonna wait a couple more seconds. And if not, we will pass on to the next participant. By the way, my apologies that I didn't, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Cristian Torres Santana. I'm a forest, uh, I'm a botanist and I am the forestry partnership lead for Latin America at Terra Formation. And I am based in Puerto Rico. And I'm very grateful to, to have many of you participating of this webinar that we organized together with the Society of American Foresters and the International Society of Tropical Foresters. So there's a question in here or a comment. Uh, it says, surprise that secondary forest only lasts five to eight years. Can you explain this more, please? The question came from Jill Thompson. Well, I cannot. Um... Uh, explain that directly because I've taken that from a um, publication uh, that's reported that I list in my list of references. Um, so you could go to that, you know, get that publication and, and read that. Um, I don't think we have enough time for me to <laughs> pull it out and read, you, read from it to you. So we have another more question in here from Elizabeth King. Uh, what are, in your views, the key differences in context for utility for 20-year plantations? Well, I mean, this is what we're coming down to is you're going to have to stop. If you, if you, it's carbon storage what you want. You got to go more than 20 years because you got to get the zero emissions. 
one of the problems with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it lasts a very long time. So there is enough without any additional warming. Some people are saying, I can't vouch for everyone, but fairly authoritative people say, it's warm enough now to um, melt the uh, Greenland ice sh sheet. So you have to get, in fact, you have to drop down the, you know, you have to drop down the amount of carbon dioxide that is now in the air. And that's, that's the really crux of the problem. And she has a follow-up question, but we are a bit short on timing here. Uh, we will notice it and we will get back to you, Elizabeth, on your, on your next question. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass on to the, to the second speaker. The second speaker uh, is Dr. Yid Barek Tibebe Wells Desimiet. He is a researcher at the Center for Agroecology Water and Resilience at Coventry University and a forest specialist advisor with FAO in Ethiopia. His presentation is on the socioeconomic and ecological sustainability of tree planting scheme governance in Ethiopia. This presentation is by Yedbarak Tibebe on the socioeconomic and ecological sustainability of tree planting schemes governance in Ethiopia. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, to start, uh, as you all may know, uh, the tree plants are being planted all over the world. Uh, as a result of uh, international uh, conventions, uh, regional commitments, and national and local government uh, initiatives. Uh, in many uh, nationalities, uh, governments spend uh, millions of dollars every year to plant trees. These planting schemes are basically uh, planted uh, or intended to deliver sustainable social, economic, and ecological outcomes. However, uh, in many countries, uh, rarely have we seen schemes that are successful in terms of uh, delivering these sustainable outcomes. These tree planting schemes and the implementers uh, specifically uh, mostly report the number of trees they have planted. Uh, this is also for governments who report uh, how many millions of trees they have planted and how local communities got involved uh, with these uh, tree planting schemes rather than reporting uh, how many trees have been grown and how many uh, landscapes are covered and how many livelihoods uh, have improved as a result. Uh, the focus is, as we have seen, on counting the trees planted, disregarding the outcomes, uh, a, which has diminished the true value of planting trees, considering them as a simple number of trees rather than potential socioeconomic and ecological uh, benefits. However, it should be noted that there are a small number of tree planting schemes all over the world where the implementers are focused on delivering these uh, socioeconomic and ecological outcomes sustainably. In order for these schemes to deliver the intended outcomes, Implementers need a mechanism that can ensure not only their planting, but also the sustainability of their outputs. That means the sustainability of the socioeconomic and ecological benefits. Hence, 
This calls for uh, governance mechanisms which are believed or expected to improve the outputs of tree planting schemes, while it's also sustaining the scheme out outcomes. The choice of the tree planting scheme governance mechanisms depends on the implementing bodies and their approach. The performance of this governance approach can be uh, determined through the sustainability of the schemes, their socioeconomic and ecological outputs. These socioeconomic outputs and ecological outputs and their sustainability differs among schemes depending on their uh, contextual uh, factors. This could be a landscape level or socio-political uh, level factors. Because of these contextual factors, it has been argued by many researchers that successful governance approach cannot be adopted or scaled up at the higher uh, landscape scale. That is, there cannot be a comprehensive governance approach. However, the success factors of each tree planting scheme in a landscape can be uh, can actually be scaled up with this objective. Uh, several researchers tried to develop tools, mechanisms, standards, and principles for a successful tree planting scheme. However, none of these studies are based on a detailed evaluation of the tree planting schemes, their socioeconomic, ecological outputs, and their sustainability. Therefore, uh, we can say that the purpose of this study is to evaluate tree planting schemes in order to adopt the governance approach of the best performing tree planting schemes. This evaluation of tree planting schemes is conducted in Ethiopia by selecting uh, schemes from different landscapes and contexts that represent Ethiopia. In this study, we aimed to assess tree planting schemes and their governance approach and their performance by assessing the, the tree planting schemes implementation mechanisms, assessing their socioeconomic and ecological outputs, and assessing the sustainability, their sustainability plans, practices, and achievements. Based on these assessments, this study aimed to identify best practice tree planting schemes, their governance uh, approach, for scale-up opportunities within Ethiopia and possibly for the, with the rest of Africa as well. In order to conduct these assessments, we selected uh, 16 uh, schemes, tree planting schemes, that are being implemented by 13 organizations. We selected these from over 33 tree planting schemes in Ethiopia that are running or that have been uh, running up until uh, or uh, till to date. These schemes are selected with the assumption that they represent the Ethiopian context in terms of their social, cultural, ecological, and landscape or economic in political uh, context as well. These selected schemes and their documents are then uh, reviewed to understand the schemes initiation context, their design, how these schemes are implemented, how these schemes are monitored and evaluated, and the sustainability plans, practices, and uh, achievements. The review of these documents is then supplemented with 
uh, an interview with scheme managers, with the tree planting scheme managers. And the interview held with these tree planting scheme managers uh, pr uh, provided more or less what has been reviewed uh, by the uh, from the project documents. The study also conducted focus group discussions and interviews with uh, beneficiary communities and their representatives. These focus group discussions and the interviews held with the community uh, beneficiaries were uh, in regard to the tree planting scheme outputs. That is the benefits in terms of socioeconomic outputs, that is the income the beneficiaries generated, and in terms of the vegetation that the scheme has covered in the landscape, and the sustainability potential of the scheme achievements. The data regarding the ecological outputs is further assessed through a remote sensing uh, mechanism and uh, through an in-person observation. Moreover, uh, we can say in this study, uh, we tried to analyze the data using comparative case study approach, the case study tree planting schemes implementation mechanisms. Uh, are compared using standard restoration principles developed by uh, the uh, for the UN decade on restoration and uh, we also used the 10 golden rules developed by the Royal Botanic Garden researchers which is published in 2021 as well and the schemes are also compared based on their uh, compliance with these principles and rules. We also use, try to compare the schemes using their, their socioeconomic outputs. And uh, that means taking the income change uh, that occurred as a result of the scheme implementation on the beneficiary's livelihood. This before and after data is obtained from each of the scheme documents and the scheme managers confirmed through uh, beneficiaries' response, or uh, we try to compare these responses. Similarly, we tried to also use to compare the schemes using their ecological outputs, that is the vegetation cover that the schemes uh, have uh, delivered in terms of vegetation cover change in the area by using the remote sensing analysis. And finally, we also compared the schemes using their sustainability plans, practices, and achievements. These sustainability plans and practice were obtained from uh, the scheme managers and their documents and uh, legitimately uh, confirmed by uh, communities or uh, beneficiaries. The, the, our results showed that in terms of the scheme implementation mechanisms, most of the schemes complied with at least half of the rules and principles we compared them against. However, in some of the schemes uh, have uh, complied with more or less all of the principles and rules that have been uh, compared against. These schemes have scored high in terms of their compliance. In terms of the socioeconomic benefits, uh, scheme managers and their documents stated 40% to 260% uh, income change on the beneficiaries while the beneficiaries themselves uh, said they have only earned or gained eight uh, up to 150% uh, income change since the scheme implementation. Similarly, we also compared the scheme uh, vegetation cover change where the scheme managers and their document stated uh, 0.15 up to 50% 
while in our remote sensing we found out that there are uh, some schemes of areas where there has been a decrease in vegetation cover change since the project started implementing there. Uh, in this regard, we can conclude that uh, most of the schemes implementation mechanisms, thereby their governance approach are comparable with one another with the exception of a few approaches uh, which include their sustainability using beneficiary institutionalization and uh, empowerment through legal recognition. Mm -hmm. It's also observed in these studies that uh, high socioeconomic or income change uh, outputs and institutional empowerment or community institutional empowerment to be considered by beneficiaries as the primary factor for uh, sustainability of schemes or for choice of schemes by uh, beneficiaries. On the other hand, the socioeconomic, ecological outputs along with the sustainability approach uh, comparison has proven this study to be a good uh, determinant of the tree planting schemes performance in terms of their governance approach and its output sustainability. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Jit Barrek, uh, unfortunately, we run a little bit short on time, and uh, but we're gonna pass you the questions at the end. We are keeping track of them, so we pass you on the questions. So our next speaker uh, is Jill Wagner. Jill is a project leader for the Hawaii Island Seed Bank in the United States, and also a consultant to terraformation. Hello, my name is Jill Wagner, and the title of my talk today is Seed Banking for Scaling Restoration. I'm going to share my screen. Seed banking is a wonderful conservation tool that allows restoration projects all over the world to scale. Seed availability can be a serious bottleneck for projects, and the way to solve it is for land managers and nursery managers to collect seed regularly and bring it into a seed lab for near and long-term restoration, as well as banking for the future. Proper handling of seed ensures continued viability and is a powerful tool that increases options and opportunity for land managers. You can see here the Future Forest Nursery in Hawaii and the Seed Bank, the Hawaii Island Seed Bank in the background there. And we have them together. We work both in the nursery and the seed bank quite a lot. And here is an intern who worked with me for a year, Callie. I want to tell you about why I believe seed banking is very important. Seed collection in temperate regions is seasonal. If you don't get the timing right, you can miss the season and you are limited by that season. In the tropics, seed can be available throughout the year, but people often collect what they need just for the year and don't bank anything. They don't store anything for the future. That is dangerous because sometimes if trees don't have a good seed year due to things like drought, then viable seed cannot be collected. And for both temperate and tropical regions, mast years happen. Trees can skip a year or several years of seeding. So if no seed is banked, then a project is limited. 
And they do things like remove a species from a project if they don't have seed for it. Climate disruption is happening more often. Wildfires, flooding, droughts, and high winds, we all see this. And that can also disrupt pollination. And this can cause limited pollination and limited viable seed. There is an increase in pests and diseases that are moving all over the world. This happens with the movement of non-native species and also because plants and trees are more stressed due to shifting weather patterns. Seed availability can be more limited in the future due to all the pressures on ecosystems. I wanna to talk to you about one of my favorite organizations, Botanical Gardens Conservation International. They put out this paper called State of the World's Trees in September of 2021. And it was a collaboration of 500 scientists all over the world who looked at the state of the world's trees. And they found that one in every three trees in the world are threatened with extinction. For me, this is a call to action. I believe we need to save resources for the next generation. This is a piece of art made by uh, Hiroki Maranoi. It's called Brazil's Rainforest Burning. And this art depicts for me how ecosystems of the world are becoming more and more separated and fragmented. They become brittle. Not only do we lose diversity within a species, but we also lose diversity of entire ecosystems. The IPCC report that came out in May this year highlighted fire as a serious threat to ecosystems. We can see this, but I do wanna point out that fires today are different than what we have historically known. If we look at what is happening in California, for example, we see that the fires are hotter and staying in place longer. Instead of low impact fires that burn for three to four days, they are now burning for months. The dry conditions of the soil and brush contributes to this. So even the big trees are killed. When the big trees die, we are not only losing the lungs of the earth, but we are losing the mother trees that represent the seed source for the future. And although there can be natural regeneration from the seed bank in the soil, if those young trees do not survive to maturity, we will not have seed for the future. Here are some solutions. Seed banks provide us with a resource for scaling, and that contributes to resilience, resiliency on, of ecosystems. Seed banking allows us to respond to disasters. If we have native seeds to propagate or to broadcast, then we have a better chance of restoring ecosystems. Saving seeds allows us to grow, and now and in the future, we can continue to scale our projects with seed banking. Seed banking is a priority in the global strategy for plant conservation. And with the proper handling of seeds, we can store them for decades or longer. Here's another one of my favorite companies. This is Terraformation. Terraformation builds off-grid solar powered seed banks. You can see in this photo, um, this is the Hawaii Island Seed Bank. This was the prototype model of Terraformation's seed banks. And you can see in the drawings that it has three workstations. There are solar panels up at the top with a backup generator, and they can store up to 10 million seeds. This seed bank is a game changer for restoration projects. It enables us to continue to do the work that we do on native forest restoration. Traditional seed banks have been very, very helpful in their role of saving the world's native seeds and food crop seeds, and this should not be underestimated. These institutions have done research that, have inform, that inform us today 
because they researched the storage capacity of seeds. What is the longevity of families and um, seeds for um, banking? They provide um, seed for emergency disaster relief. And of course, they support biodiversity preservation. The vision today is to create a global network of regional seed banks. You can see in this photo that was um, part of a, a paper um, published in Nature um, about the need for restoration. And here are the, the, the global hotspots of the world. You can see in this equatorial region above and below the equatorial region, there is a huge need for restoration. And that means a huge need for seed banks. And so the vision is really to develop many, many thousands of regional seed banks so that we can put seeds into the hands of people. And we do that by teaching people how to collect and bank their native seeds and creating network of seed bankers all over the world. I will talk to you about some of the criticisms that I've personally heard from um, large restoration projects or of any size that talk about um, why they, they're not interested in seed banking. And I wanna and talk also about my response to that. Some projects say that they need all of the seed that they collect now. They cannot save seed because they're trying to scale and I, I believe that if we don't collect and save some seed now, we don't know what we will be able to collect in the future. Seed banking is expensive and people say they cannot afford the, the labs and the staff and cannot afford um, to pay staff. And um, my response is that seed banking usually starts with nursery managers and their staff, and then they develop the project over time. And these restoration seed banks are not the huge institutional seed banks, but they do a great job of storing seeds properly and storing millions of seeds for projects. Some people say seed banking is expensive, but if you're doing a restoration seed bank, um, the equipment is all low tech, it's off the shelf items, and it works very well for working seed banks. Some groups collect large quantities of seeds. And what happens is that if they don't process that seed and save it properly, or just even if it's for a year or two, um, it will get rotten and it will be wasted rather than um, being stored. And that's very unfortunate. I believe we need to save seeds now to scale up restoration and we need to save seeds and resources for the next generation. Seed banking is a great backup. And I think it is an opportunity that we should all embrace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill Wagner. Uh, that was an excellent talk. And we have a couple more minutes in here uh, for questions. What I am wondering is if somebody can help me redirect the questions that are directly for Jill and her presentation. I see one here for from Daniel Debra. Um, can I get, I'll read it off. Would you like me to do that? Yes, please. Okay, there are other questions for her. I acknowledge that we'll, we can take up in the discussion. Most native species, and he's from Ghana, most native species in tropical Africa are desiccant intolerant. Storing them for future growing seasons is quite um, difficult due to their storage behavior. Even desiccation tolerant species, um, even desiccate, lose viability and storage. How can tropical Africa store seeds for subsequent reforestation work with no state-of-the-art storage facilities. Thank you. All right, 
thank you very much for the question. There are two questions there actually. So one is on the storage capacity of seeds. A lot of, there are a lot of seeds in the tropics that are called recalcitrant. Those seeds cannot be dried and stored. They need, it's kind of like an avocado or a mango seed. They need to be stay wet and they need to be propagated right away. So those seeds cannot be stored only for very, very short periods. But there are a lot of seeds in the tropics. There are many, many seeds that are orthodox. They can be dried and stored. And if they're stored properly, then they can be used for, for many, many decades. So I think that- I'm not um, sure. I think we're gonna move on to the next one, but they'll be taken up later if you're helping, so. Um, to, to, to dry those seeds is, is really, really big. And we need to continue to start collecting tropical seeds and banking the orthodox seed that are um, desiccant tolerant. And then um, the second question about developing seed banks is um, one that I think is, is very important. I think that we need to, first of all, realize the importance of it and that it, it has to be done. And I really appreciate Terraformation's approach and these um, solar these solar powered seed banks made out of shipping containers are very practical. And it's not like the institutional seed banks, these huge buildings. Um, it's a much simpler and smaller scale approach, but it really does the job and um, and can really function well for a lot of a lot of projects in the world. So that's um, a, a good solution to look into. And uh, somebody asked how many seed banks exist now. There are only about 400 in the world, and we need about maybe 100,000 if you base that on the restoration potential. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, there are still some couple more questions, but we're going to pass on those for the question for the for the next session. Uh, right now, we have uh, patience, Jennifer Turia Riva. Sorry, my apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name your name right. Uh, she is a retired forester and a tree farmer in Uganda. And she's going to be talking about eucalyptus, a non-native species grown in Uganda. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. My name is Patience Jennifer Tuliareva from Uganda. I'm a retired forester and currently I spend my time doing some tree farming. I'm going to share with you about eucalyptus, a non-native species growing in Uganda. Uh, eucalyptus is commonly called Kalitusi. It was introduced in Uganda in 1912 and has been grown in the country ever since. As a result, most people do not believe that eucalyptus is an exotic species. They believe that it is actually an indigenous. It was introduced to provide mainly fuel wood for the growing urban communities in the country. I first got to notice eucalyptus when I was a little girl. Um, I was visiting with my maternal grandparents and a branch fell from a tree. Uh, one of us was told please, to please go and pick the branch and bring it to the homestead. And it was chopped uh, and used for firewood. Uh, my next vivid experience with with Kalitusi or eucalyptus was when I was a teenager I was visiting with my paternal grandparents and my grandfather asked me if I could go with him to his woodlot when we got to his woodlot he was there to check on his beehives and we checked on them uh, um, I noticed that the trees were the same as what I had seen at my maternal grandparents home 
uh, we checked the beehives, that be the honey was eventually harvested. We ate some of it and the rest was sold. Uh, I was told, when I asked, I was told that the tree was called Kalitusi. I also noticed that there were a large number of Kalitusi trees or eucalyptus trees growing in Kampala city where I lived, uh, on the roadsides, in, in people's compounds, in church compounds, in hospital compounds, and so on. So as it was probably be, had probably been planted as an ornamental as well. Uh, later, uh, when I grew up, I chose to study forestry, and I learned that eucalyptus was introduced in Uganda from Australia. It was introduced in 1912 by the colonial government, and they introduced it uh, to help provide firewood for our growing urban centers. Uh, there, there are unconfirmed reports that it may have been introduced in 1903 by our missionaries. All urban centers in Uganda, most urban centers in Uganda have eucalyptus woodlots or with eucalyptus plantations close by. Uh, say, for example, in Kampala, the nearest uh, uh, wood, uh, central forest reserve is called Namave, and it was planted mainly with eucalyptus. Right now, it is being converted into an industrial park, but it was the main source of fuel wood at some point in Kampala city. In Chewaka, there is another, uh, in near Entebbe, there is another central forest reserve called Chewaga Forest Reserve. It too was planted with eucalyptus, and that was ideally to provide uh, firewood for the growing Entebbe municipality. All, mo most of the other cities around the country have uh, eucalyptus plantations close by. Uh, in a, in cases where people were having challenges getting firewood, they were encouraged to grow eucalyptus trees for their firewoods. Now, uh, eucalyptus charmed the hearts of many people because it was a fast growing tree species. It coppiced very well and provided good firewood. Uh, commercial traders also began trading in firewood because uh, they, they were the growing, because of the annoying growing number of schools, hospitals, prisons, and other industries that use firewood, the demand for firewood was growing, and the indigenous species were not who did not provide adequate firewood to meet that demand. So commercial traders also started trading in firewood. Uh, as the construction industry grew, eucalyptus became an important source of building poles and the timber for scaffolding. Eucalyptus also became an important source of fencing posts, uh, transmission poles for uh, the telecommunications industry and the energy sector. The use of eucalyptus for timber has also increased, uh, but it's mainly used for roofing and for doors and windows. Uh, there's, there are very few carpenters who use eucalyptus to make other furniture like chairs, tables, beds, and so on. But it's mainly used in, in construction-related furniture. Uh, there are stories that there were some unscapulous traders in the, one of our cities called Imbarara, where they sold eucalyptus timber as mahogany. They had harvested eucalyptus trees which were over 30 years, and the timber looked like mahogany so they told farm they told their clients that this was mahogany and people bought and the, the traders made a good kill out of that trade eucalyptus also became an important source of income uh, as i indicated earlier both my grandparents used to grow eucalyptus and i was told that my grandmother uh, my maternal grandmother cut her trees and, and, and sold timber, and she used the money to renovate her, her house. My father told me personally that he also uh, cut the trees his father left him and uh, used the money that he made for, to pay uh, tuition for one of my sisters. I am also doing tree farming, and I'm growing eucalyptus, and I'm making money from 
uh, eucalyptus. So there are other many other people who are uh, growing eucalyptus as a source of income. Uh, today, many timber yards across the country are stocked with eucalyptus timber. Now, there has been a controversy, in particularly in the early 1980s, uh, 90s, where there was talk that eucalyptus uh, destroyed the environment. Uh, eucalyptus trees had been used to drain swamps as, a, as part of the fight against malaria because uh, mosquitoes breed in stagnant water. Swamps have plenty of stagnant water. So it was the policy to try and uh, remove stagnant water by to, to deny mosquitoes a breeding ground by removing the stagnant water. Uh, it was also, they were also draining swamps as part of the, of, of the expanding, agri, expanding agricultural land where the swamps would be reclaimed uh, for crop and dairy farming. And this was done mainly in areas where land was scarce uh, or the populations had grown so much that there wasn't adequate land for people to plant, to grow crops and, and keep their animals. Uh, many, however, many farmers today do not want eucalyptus growing close to their crop, to their gardens or their cropland. They say that eucalyptus spoils the farmland. Uh, some of the pertinent issues uh, researchers have been studying are uh, soil degradation, reduce, reduction in ground water levels, and reduction in biodiversity. Uh, first of all, the fight against malaria has now focused on removing stagnant water close to the homes and not in the swamps far away. Uh, and depending on management practices one is, is, is using, it is possible to maintain a fairly good diverse ecosystem. Say, for example, by leaving some indigenous species, tree species within uh, a eucalyptus woodlot. So, for example, where I am growing uh, eucalyptus, I have allowed, I've left in uh, trees of my sopsis emini or musizi in my woodlot. So, I do have, uh, I, I have planted eucalyptus, but I have also left in an indigenous species. So, uh, ideally, it, it would help in, increase the biodiversity in that area. I've also noticed that uh, birds rarely nest in eucalyptus trees. They may stop by, but they do not uh, build their nests in eucalyptus trees. Uh, the leaves and the seeds of eucalyptus do not seem to provide food for many fauna. I have only noticed mainly many termites that seem to feed on eucalyptus. Uh, so it probably gives a a picture that uh, eucalyptus really doesn't encourage other biodiversity to grow around. And in the area of soil degradation, it really depends on the way the land is, has been used before the eucalyptus is planted and what, and what happens during the time eucalyptus is actually occupying the land. Tree farmers are supposed to do a soil analysis before they plant any trees. Unfortunately, most tree farmers do not do that, including myself. I do not do a soil analysis before I plant trees. Uh, yet it is a best practice, but most of us avoid it. But I think mainly because of the high cost of doing soil analysis. Uh, then uh, uh, fast growing plants are bound to, to, to consume a lot of water and the uh, and they, they will consume a lot of water and the carbon dioxide. And they will, they will also emit a lot of oxygen. So it is difficult to, it, it's whatever, if, if a plant is growing very fast, chances are that the ground the groundwater levels will, will be affected. Uh, in Uganda, uh, if all you want is green cover, uh, it is, it's possible to just ignore a piece of land for some time and within a few months uh, it, the place will be green, covered with vegetation. And within about a year, two years, uh, colonizing tree species will begin to emerge. So if the purpose of reforestation is, is uh, just to have vegetation, then just ignoring a piece of land would be adequate to 
ensure that the place is eventually covered with vegetation. However, uh, if you choose to use trees, tree species for uh, reforestation, then uh, it's important to look at what the farmer is interested in, what the tree farmer is interested in. The tree farmer would like a, a, a product, and what is the final product that the tree farmer is looking for? If the tree farmer is looking for wood, uh, wood products, then uh, eucalyptus would be a good alternative. Uh, however, if you're looking at biodiversity as an important aspect, then the use of uh, the use of indigenous tree species would be most ideal, and a mixture of indigenous species and not a monoculture one one uh, tree species. So whenever one decides to do reforestation, one should actually look at what the owner of the land or what the tree farmer is looking out for. The final product would be an important gauge in the decision of what tree species to use. Now, that is what I wanted to share with you. I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. May God bless you. And thank you very much, uh, Patience. Uh, really appreciate your time on this talk. Uh, we have a we have a couple minutes for questions for Patience. Uh, let me see if uh, I can easily read them from here. They are very informative presentations, but I would like to know how do you see the challenge of incorporating or introducing fast growing and invasive exotic species in new plantations? which is beneficial for charcoal producers, but harmful for conservation. Biodiversity, case of acacia, auriculiniformis, and mangium plantations in Haiti. Loved by NGO for quick results, but invade our native forest ecosystems. And the question <laughs> came from either Eudate. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, Indeed, if you know that a species is going to be invasive, I don't think you should introduce it because it's going to disrupt the indigenous ecosystem in that area. Let us remember that many of these invasive species, we are talking about eucalyptus, acacia, and so on, were introduced in the 1900s when uh, knowledge that was there was different from what we know now. Now we know that you can introduce a species and it becomes a nuisance in a certain area. So for example, like the water hyacinth, the water hyacinth was a real problem in this country, uh, uh, blocking uh, fish, fish landing sites, affecting electricity generation and so on. So getting rid of it was very, very expensive for our government. So um, ideally, if you suspect that a a uh, tree species is going to be invasive, don't, don't bother trying to introduce it. And we now know that a lot of our indigenous species are actually very good for different purposes. So it would be good to start by investigating, uh, do we have an indigenous species, a local species that can provide what we are looking for? If we have a local or an indigenous tree species that can provide what you're looking for, then use that. Because uh, remember it is, uh, I would say that God put it in that place for a purpose. That's why it is there, so make use of it. I believe that those who introduced these species in our countries did it because they thought they were doing the right thing. They had seen eucalyptus doing well in different countries. And so they said, let's take it to Uganda, let's take it to Kenya, let's take it to South Africa and so on. But now we have studied and we have seen that we have really good species in our, in our countries. So let's take advantage of what we have. God gave them to us in our countries for a purpose. Thank you very much, Patience. We indeed have uh, more questions for you, but we're gonna pass on to the next speaker and keep the questions for the next session. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is Hernan Saldivar, 
Cuscus, an ecosystem restoration specialist we prefer by nature. I believe he's based in Peru. And his co-author of the presentation is Richard Donovan, who's a forest advisor in the United States. Also, we prefer by nature. Their presentation is ecosystem restoration, credibility and verification approach at the next level. Leave you on with, with Bernard. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us to this symposium. On this day, we will be discussing the credibility and the field verification approach to restoration projects in the search of a structured protocol for evaluating restoration activities at the field level and the environmental and social impacts of restoration projects which is a problem that needs to be addressed in order for the project developers and restoration investors can increase the chances of success on their projects. My name is Hernán Saldívar, a specialist in ecosystem restoration in Refer by Nature. Today, I'm joined with Richard Donovan, who will be joining us at the final of the presentation. Refer by Nature is an NGO founded in 1994 in Denmark. We work with businesses, NGOs, and governments on developing solutions to major global changes as such deforestation and climate change. Now, we're going to start talking a little bit about the ecosystem restoration standard by Refrain by Nature. The objective of this standard is to assess the implementation of the ecosystem restoration activities at the field level. This document provides a practical standard for field verification of performance in implementing ecosystem restoration, where the restoration is technically, environmentally, socially and economically appropriate. This standard has four key elements. Was designed to the audit performance at any scale, small to large, and any point of ongoing restoration projects, in tropical, temperate, and boreal biomes. The small projects are considered as those restoring a fewer than 100 hectares, and the large projects are defined as being created like a 10,100 hectares. And the medium sized projects are between the two, uh, between small and big projects. Also, projects managed by communities are also grouped with small projects and together refer to as small holders and community projects. The ecosystem restoration may include use of techniques such as management of natural forests agroforestry, uh, conservation agriculture, reforestation, participatory management, impact logging, and rewilding. Priority is placed on the use of native species, but also allowing the use of alien species, where you, the, the use of these alien species provide a nursing or similar qualities leading towards to re-establishment of the natural forest cover or ecosystem functions. The standard can be used for first party, second party, or third party evaluation or audits of performance. The hectare threshold for large scale and small operation may be adjusted based on the geography or correspondence size limits requirements in certification systems or another accountability tools which may use in parallel with this verification tool. There is a scientific evidence connecting more effective forest stewardship with indigenous traditional peoples and local communities, usually attributed to their active participation in forest governance. Their direct benefits for forest products and desire to maintain their resource for future generations. The proposed approach creates a series of core and continuous improvements. Core improvements means those which shall be assessed and verified in every situation with positive performance at the field level considered crucial and required all in all the cases. The continuous improvement indicators mean partial success in implementation is acceptable if credible field level progress is evident. The ecosystem restoration standard by Grafeda in Asia has four different uh, parts. Like you see in the screen, the first one is the planification stage, which have seven indicators. One of these seven indicators, one of the most important indicators is the restoration plan. This restoration plan 
need be aligned to effectively reverse the degradation condition and recognize, manage, or restore the characteristics and value in the device. When it is applicable, in this restoration plan, need to be described the plan selection for this this uh, for this project. The restoration plan need to describe the expected environmental and social impact of the project, including potential harm and unaided consequences, and how the restoration effort is addressing them. The restoration plan need be documented in handwriting. And of course, we aim to this restoration plan indeed include a, continue, a continuation strategy. The second part of the standard is regarding to tenure right and engagement. In this part, the restoration manager shall use culturally sensitive engagement taking into consideration the social and economic dynamics to ensure that affected stakeholders are transparently and effectively consulted and engagement with all inclusive manner in the restoration planning, implementation and monitoring and aware of the expected actions and benefits. The restoration manager shall support transparent and inclusive participation of affected parties when making decisions on actions that will impact on clear impl implications on the landscape beyond the project boundaries. The relevant part of the engagement process should be documented, including in all agreed commitments of resources, labors, and responsibility for action by all involved individuals and parties and organizations. The third part of the standard is about the implementation part. In the implementation part, we address the environmental issues and of course, one of the most important things in the restoration project, that is the social issues. In the, in the social part, the standard uh, address the local labor like a priority on the on, on the standard and also it's important to make be clear about the workers right and any implementation of the on this project it's very important to be clear that it's not allowed it's not permitted a child labor in the pro, in the in the restoration project it's not allowed to force our compulsory labor no discrimination of any kind in the in the restoration project is permit under our standard. The project need be addressed and need be allowed the equal remuneration regarding the gender on the on the spur and the on the project. It's forbidding abusive practice or only disciplinary procedures. Is the standard look um, uh, looking for better working conditions for the for the labor for the labor in the in the restoration projects, the occupational work and health and safety will occur in accordance with local and legal and permit requirements, including safe the use of equipment or consistent use of personal protective protective equipment. The final part of the standard is regarding and monitoring. And I think it's one of the most important things uh, of this standard because in our experience uh, around the world, because this standard was uh, testing in more than 10 countries uh, uh, in different continents, we see the monitoring of the outcome of the, of the standards is one of the main struggle issues for the monitoring for their ecosystem restoration projects. The monitoring of the outcomes and the adaptive management, one of the two more important things about when we're talking about the monitoring in our standard. For example, the planting and sealing or natural regeneration need be monitored annually, including survival rights, health, for example, pests and diseases, and in a technical fashion sound, including practical, consistent, and transparent and repeatable, and repeatable actions. All these actions need to be taken for continuous improvement based on monitoring outcomes evident at the field level. And finally, when we're talking about adaptive management, 
it's important that the monitor results are compiled annually and used to enhance achievement of the restoration targets, goals, and objectives to improve the activities of the restoration project in the following years. Now, I will leave you with my colleague Richard with the final comments of the restoration standard by preferred by nature. Thank you. Hey there, this is Richard Donovan, Independent Forest Advisor, and I've been working with Hernan Zaldivar and Mateo Cariño and others at Preferred by Nature over the last three years on the verification standard for restoration, ecosystem restoration, that Hernan has just presented to you. Um, it has been a very interesting process. We've gone through multiple drafts. We've sought input from all of the restoration initiatives that we could communicate with, as many as were practical. We've done field tests, as Hernan has probably explained, in temperate and tropical regions, multiple countries. The emphasis of the standard has always been on the practical aspects. So we've been lucky in that uh, we have a lot of people that have been open to testing the standard because they were thinking about their own monitoring, reporting, and verification systems. The results of those field tests have been very positive in general. People feel that the language in the standard is fairly direct and written in language that practitioners understand. We've tried to be practical throughout. We've tried to be open-minded as to what type of restoration intervention you might use this standard to work with. So we've made sure to include the key elements of planning, tenure rights, customary, and indigenous, engagement with both rights holders and sta other stakeholders, particularly those directly affected. We've worked on implementation of key concepts like high conservation values or rare threatened endangered species, free prior and informed consent on the social side, as well as, of course, the landscape or ecological context in which the restoration is happening. And finally, something that we place emphasis on is trying to put in put indicators in there that cover aspects of monitoring and adaptive management. Ultimately, our goal is that these be durable certifications, durable restorations. Maybe they'll be certified in the future under some system, but our primary emphasis has been for first, second, and third party reporting of all kinds. So that the main thing is that there's a way of being accountable and reporting with accuracy. We've been very open to all the kinds of different systems that are out there for restoration, as I mentioned before, with an emphasis, yes, on tree planting when that's appropriate, but also things like agroforestry, rewilding, assisted natural regeneration and regeneration, and ecosystem management. We don't expect any standard will be perfect, but we hope that you'll find this one useful and look forward to working with you in any way we can to help you with your efforts going forward on restoration globally. Let's make this UN Decade restoration successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hernan and, and Richard. I actually enjoy very much your presentation with background music that kept me peaceful while, while learning at the same time. Uh, we have a couple minutes for question. There was a question that came up in the chat from Samuel Mensa Op Opoku. Uh, his question is how ecosystem restoration standard differ from the Forest Stewardship Council certification? Hello, uh, thank you very much for, for, you, for your talks. Um, yeah, well, firstly, um, I, let me send your regards from Richard. It can be possible to join us this morning because they have a full agenda this morning. So, and regarding the question, well, the our standard for 
ecosystem restoration is very focused in the restoration of the ecosystem. It's a little bit different to the forest conscious of the FSC uh, certification. The FSC certification is most related to um, the well management forest for uh, products and also now with the uh, ecosystem services, but it's not related with the uh, activities of, of restoration in the, in the, at the field level. Uh, our standard is very focused on the, the assess how the, uh, these activities uh, are managed in the, in the very good way uh, with the objective of have to a very good uh, ecosystem restoration. So it's, uh, it's kind of different approach between these two standards uh, but I think uh, we believe it's a uh, very. Um, we can work together with the FSC, and we actually we work always with the, with the FSC. They are part of our consultation. Uh, they are part of our consultation uh, bodies to to develop this standard. So. Thank you very much, Hernan. Uh, I'm going to pass on to the next speaker. Uh, who's the last one of our symp symposium. Uh, his name is uh, Will Anderson, and he's uh, the land restoration project manager with the Global Restoration Initiative at the World Resources Institute in the United States. His presentation is the what, why, and how of funding restoration projects. Hi everyone, my name is Will Anderson. I am the Restoration Projects Manager at the World Resources Institute, and it's really nice to talk to you today about the what, the why, and how of funding restoration projects of all sizes. We all know that land restoration delivers many benefits. On the climate side, along with conservation, it can provide 30% of the solution needed to slow climate change by 2030. It provides water benefits, can improve soil health, can provide food and forest products for people, and it can also provide a financial incentive and benefit for people. Our research shows that every $1 invested in restoration can yield seven to 30 US dollars in benefits. That's nothing to sneeze at. But at the same time, despite that opportunity, there's still a massive gap for conservation and restoration financing. A 2015 report from Credit Suisse said that there's a $300 billion a year shortfall. So with that opportunity, why is there that shortfall? We'll get into that a little bit today. First to say, you know, at WRI, we've been working on this question for seven years now. Um, we've published reports like the business of planting trees. We've worked directly with projects and enterprises through programs like the Land Accelerator Capacity Building Program. We've connected them to finance with programs like TerraMatch, and we've directly funded them through TerraFund for AFR 100 and other programs. So I wanted to set the stage by showing that we have research and practical experience to back up what we're saying here today. Our main lesson, of course, no one's surprised, all projects of all sizes need finance right now. But depending on their size and where they are, they have different needs for finance. And one thing that's important is that ticket size matters. If you're a project that needs 50,000 US dollars or less, there's different financing options for you than if you're a project that needs more than $500,000. And the projects that are, have the hardest time attracting funding are those in the middle, the ones that receive 50 to 500,000 US dollars. And so today we're gonna take this kind of example, uh, this framework, and we're gonna run it through an example. And that is our program called Terra Fund for AFR 100. Um, it was an opportunity and a fund for us to fund 100 of Africa's top land restoration projects and enterprises that are locally led. We provided each of them 50 to 500,000 US dollars in grants and loans with our partners One Tree Planted on the nonprofit side and Realize Impact on the enterprise side. And we've already started moving funding to the ground. When we launched this program, we expected to get a few hundred or up to a thousand applications in the two week application window. Instead, we got 3,200 applications with an average funding ask of $145,000 from 31 African countries. And the organizations had an average of nine years of experience working on restoration projects. That was astounding. As you can imagine, it was difficult to go through all those applications and try and understand who were the best to give them an opportunity to prove their worth and to get financing. But after a couple of months of work, we were able to, by May of this year, select our 100 projects and enterprises, only nine months after we initially did our outreach across 27 countries that are going to restore 20,000 hectares, 
and grow 26 million trees. And you can see the geographical distribution of those projects on the right um, on the map of Africa. So of those 3,200 applications, how did we narrow it down? We used a very strict screening criteria that was focused on organizational health, on the ability of projects to monitor, on their ecological health and ability to choose the correct species on their community engagement. And we found that the vast majority of the applications were not quite ready for finance. And you can see that in the early stage organizations part of the pyramid on the left. We found that there were a lot of people who were developing, so were a little bit stronger, a lot that were aspiring, stronger still, rising and acting. And you can see here that the top three, the rising, the aspiring, and the acting organizations were the ones that we funded the most through TerraFund for AFR 100. And so you can see here, we looked at the portfolio, we broke it down, and we showed that 2,000 were not quite ready for finance. So either they were dreamers or they had just not followed the rules of the application. But most importantly for us, more than 900 applications had actually promise out of those 3,000 that we could potentially fund. There were 776 that kind of had some experience but needed more technical support and a good 120 that actually had a lot of traction and really could you know absorb finance at the scale between 50 and 500 thousand dollars which was very heartening for us and so today we're going to start by talking about that first part the organizations that didn't quite make the cut here but still need finance those small projects of less than fifty thousand dollars so these are young nonprofit innovators and early stage companies. Think of local organizations, cooperatives, those kind. They have little organizational infrastructure. They might not have great accounting. They might not have kind of a robust internal employee system. They might not even have employees. Um, and they need technical assistance to get access to finance. They might have traction in one area and they're looking to expand into other geographies. They might have raised money from friends and family, but probably if not from institutional financiers in the past. And they need flexible finance to scale up their new ideas and models because they're trying things out for the first time. It's inherently more riskier than larger scale organizations. An example of where they could get funding is crowdfunding. You know, there's positives and negatives to crowdfunding. The positives are it's accessible to everyone. There's, it's quick and unrestricted funding that you can deploy very quickly. And there's solid existing platforms like Global Giving, you can see in the right there, that allow anyone to really create projects and get finance there. The negatives is that there's a ton of people out there looking for crowdfunding. It's really hard to assess the project quality if you're a funder based on crowdfunding websites alone. Um, there's high transaction fees on these platforms of 5% or higher, which really eats into the amount of money that donors are giving. It makes it harder deal for them. And there's little transparency after funding. There's often an ability to give finance um, and updates on the platform, but very little kind of robust monitoring data. Or small grant funds, you know about these. These are kind of like $50,000 grants or $30,000 grants given out to organizations. The positives for this is that they're low risk to funders. You can fund many of them at once um, because they're smaller ticket sizes. So if you want to fund a lot of organizations, it's easier to do it this way. You can invest in risky organizations and ideas from young innovators because you know that even if it goes wrong, you still won't lose too much money. But the negatives are that there are high transaction and processing costs. It often costs the same amount of money to process a $50,000 grant as it does a $500,000 grant. And so it makes it a little bit less attractive for funders to fund these people. Um, smaller sums are less useful for growing organizations and companies. They're often looking for a little bit more money than what they've had in the past. And so it makes it difficult for them to scale up. And it's hard to track impact of these small scale investments or it's just not worth it because the investments are so small you can't really invest in robust monitoring and evaluation and what we've been doing is working a lot with these small scale projects to bring them up to the medium size levels the 500 up to five hundred thousand dollar ticket size the land accelerator is a training program we've run since 2018 for entrepreneurs that restore degraded land so for-profit businesses but locally led ones um, we've done it in Africa, we've done it, we're doing it in Brazil now, we've done it in South Asia. We've had 5,000 applications to this program or more since 2018. So it shows that there's real demand for this kind of capacity building support. And we've directly supported last year alone 168 companies and given special attention to 45. Of those 45, they've each received kind of a small innovation grant, just like that small grant fund I talked about of $5,000. Um, and Top applications in Africa actually have access to an even larger pot of money through TerraFund, an initiative I talked about earlier that does provide loans for small scale projects. So you can see here that without capacity building, small scale projects often will stay at that small scale level. But once they graduate up to this larger level of medium scale projects, again up to $500,000, they have a whole other set of challenges they face. These are more mature nonprofit innovators and growth stage companies. They have good infrastructure. 
but they still need technical assistance. So by infrastructure, I mean they know how to use accounting practices or they have you know, professional staff on, on hand, might have a couple here or there. Um, they have real traction in one, one or more areas and looking to expand rapidly to different communities or different areas. Um, they've experienced managing small external grants, so not just crowdfunding, but you know, grants given by organizations like WRI or Wintry Planted or loans. But they still need flexible finance. <clears throat> they can't just take any finance because they're still learning, innovating, and growing. Um, but they can work with clear deliverables. So if you're a funder, you give them deliverables, they can usually, they can usually deliver. And so what we've done with a lot of these organizations, what they're facing in their challenges are that they really can't get access to finance between fifty dollars or $500,000. Funders either want to expand into big projects or they want to stay at the small level. Those kind of people, to get them up to big projects, it's more risky inherently because you're giving someone their first opportunity to prove themselves. And so what we've done at WRI <clears throat> is that we've created something called a revolving loan fund. How this works is that an entrepreneur is vetted by business experts and signs a contract. They receive a loan. They pay back a portion of that loan every month, just like a regular loan. Um, if the enterprise makes all payments on time and submits their impact reports, the final payment's forgiven. So the interest rate's only 4% instead of the 20 or 30% interest rate a lot of these small scale entrepreneurs are looking at as they're trying to expand. And then capital, once it's repaid back, goes to other graduates of the Land Accelerator or other programs that are training these kind of entrepreneurs. So you can see how we're trying to bring them up the ladder, give them more information so they can graduate up into that larger kind of ticket size. And two examples here, Nguni Nursery. This is a great native tree nursery that we've given a loan to in South Africa, led by Sia Bolela Sokomani. It has 55 staff. They're planting 45 native tree species and grown 400,000 in the last two years alone. Um, solid organization. Exotic EPZ, it's a macadamia nut processing and export company in Kenya. They've been working with over 2,000 farmers in a distributed way so they can plant these kind of high impact trees on farms. They have over 145 employees and we're also giving them a loan right now. So in order, when they can demonstrate their ability to pay back that loan and to access finance at that scale, then it becomes easier to convince people <clears throat> to invest in these projects at a larger scale at 500,000 US dollars or more. These are the organizations you might hear about kind of more in the news. These are ones with a demonstrated ability to manage a lot of money. They have professional staff with organizational and technical expertise. They own infrastructure like trucks and tractors and, and greenhouses and can scale production of plants very quickly. They look for multi-year financing because they have that kind of infrastructure already. So they have to continue to maintain it and keep it up. And they often have traction across thousands of hectares, especially in places where land is more available like Latin America. Um, and they, most importantly and crucially, have the ability to track their impact and communicate success to funders, which is extremely important as organizations want to have longevity and consistency in how they receive funding. And so an example of this kind of organization is Wells for Zoe. This is an organization that is now growing 1.25 million trees with two funding initiatives, the Prices Planet Coalition and another 340,000 with that Terra Fund initiative I talked about. They have the ability to scale to up to 14 million trees because they work with a lot of communities, they've mobilized them and they have demonstrated success in the past. They're very responsive to questions, both their local and international staff are very involved and are always willing to answer funders or other partners' questions. They're always monitoring and proving their success through transparent communications. And they're restoring an entire landscape by engaging communities, the governments, and traditional leaders. In this project, for example, they're reforesting mountain ranges that have been deforested by charcoal production. And so by showing the total impact of what they're able to achieve, that can inspire more and more funders to do it. Another example here is Symbiosis Investimentos, which is an organization in Brazil led by the, that man right there, Bruno Mariani. They want to restore 50,000 hectares by 2030 by growing 2 million native tree seedlings for reforestation projects. And how they do that is they invest heavily in research and development for native species that have been historically not invested in by the traditional forestry research departments. Um, they're rescuing genetic material of these native species to restore trees that are on the brink of extinction in the Atlantic forest in Brazil. And we've been providing them technical assistance to expand their seed collection, germination, cloning, and monitoring and communication support to get them the finance that they need to scale up their impact even further. And so the question often is like, okay, there's a lot of examples, a lot of projects here, but how do we build a real ecosystem for projects large and small? We gotta start by creating a pipeline like we had spoken about there with Terra Fund. Where are these organizations? What are they doing? What's their capacity? We need to build up their capacity, like I said earlier, through programs like the Land Accelerator. 
we need to design and mobilize financial flows that actually work for these projects, and we can get in more to that later. We need to track progress with transparent monitoring. This is the number one question that funders ask us at WRI. How can you prove success? And then in order to scale up, we have to engage large investors, government, and platforms to scale. And so the example I'm going to give here very briefly is of AFR 100. We're entering into the second phase, this exciting African-led initiative. Um, we are working to develop a central system to register and monitor the capital and capacity needs of all locally led projects, enterprises, and government agencies within leading jurisdictions, for example, the country of Ghana. And so what it does is that it does two things. It allows with the centralized system to deliver capacity development through programs like the Land Accelerator and other programs that partners are, are creating, and capital through initiatives like AFR 100 and Terra Fund for AFR 100. That's financing and monitoring those shovel-ready projects. And the idea is that we move people through this pipeline, so they start at the small scale at around $50,000 or less, and they move up so they're able to absorb million-dollar tickets in the future. It's the only way we're going to be able to meet demand um, for these projects is by increasing supply, and the only solution is locally led. And so through these registries, our goal, like I just said, is to take the aspiring, this is the current pyramid I showed earlier, to catalog those needs, to align donors into that registry, to show them that if you work with this pipeline, provide them technical capacity support that, and direct finance, that's going to enable them to scale up, that then we change the curve. We change the curve from this kind of pyramid that kind of has a lot of people who are aspiring to a lot of fundable projects projects that can really get, you know, create impact that's demonstrable and to move more and more people on this pipeline. And it's not an opposite pyramid because we want to keep a lot of people at that aspiring stage. We want to increase the amount of people in the pipeline and in the restoration industry while getting more of them financing and technical capacity support. And so you can see here a little bit of a preview of what this kind of registry system could look like for a country like Ghana. The ability to kind of catalog all these needs and requirements in one place to then finance them, monitor them, and create enabling policies and procedures that are going to help them achieve success within those jurisdictions. So that was a lot. I thank you for, for listening. Um, and you can see here, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me and the team that I work on, which is the TerraMatch team at WRI, um, at the email terramatch at WRI.org. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, my final statement will be that it's the perfect opportunity for us to invest in locally led land restoration projects. Let's not lose that opportunity and let's over the next UN decade on ecosystem restoration through 2030, invest in those locally led solutions and empower communities all around the world to restore their land in the most ecologically, biologically and economically successful way that they possibly can. So I thank you and have a lovely day. Thank you very much, Will. We really appreciate your, your presentation. We're running a little bit late, but don't worry that in a couple more minutes, we're gonna go back to the questions and answers. And we certainly have a couple for you. So uh, I wanna thank to all of you. Uh, we have uh, completed the first uh, six presentations on, the, on this webinar. Now we're gonna have uh, John Welker, John Walker leads the international forest. Uh, he, he's an international forestry consultant in the United States, and he's going to be doing a wrap up of all the other presentations. So if I can start him in here. I think we're good. Can you hear me, Christian? Perfectly, yes. Okay. Well, I've been asked to do a five minute wrap up. So this is gonna be quick, um, obviously. Very quickly, I, my background is in forestry throughout my life. I've got motivated in this many years ago because of it's uh, about forestry and economic development and the linkages and the uh, multiplier effects and I've, throughout my career, I've trained and practiced in forest planning, economic analysis, uh, silviculture, forest projects, due diligence, and forest inventories. I've worked in tropical, subtropical, and temperate forest ecosystems. 
And that's what interested me in this symposium uh, when I talked to Sheila, because it covered a lot of the major themes. So let me just give you some of my general uh, observations and then talk briefly about what I heard today uh, in the talks. That, uh, well, first of all, trees are trending. Um, I've never seen so much uh, increased interest and in needs and the wants for forest services. Uh, and the needs and wants are greater than the supply of resources to fund these needs and wants and what we can do. Um, the other thing that's trending is the, the consideration of environmental, political, and social components in any projects. Uh, it's always been there, a need for that, but it's it's trending in corporations and elsewhere. Um, this symposium was called Pros and Cons as a subtitle, and that's a good attention grabber. But I really think as we go forward, I think we, in my rest of my comments, are going to talk about the commonalities and differences between reforestation and restoration as concepts. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about the commonalities of the, uh, uh, what I find in the speakers in the audience, even though I can't talk to the audience, I'm being presumptuous, but I think we're all passionate about forestry and plant-based solutions to problems. Um, we also probably believe that the scientific method and using working hypotheses are a way to achieve the objectives we're all interested in. Um, I believe that we're all, as professionals and practitioners, we're very similar to the nursing profession and believing in evidence-based practices. We look at empiricism as the guide to what we should be doing. Um, I think that we believe that ecosystems uh, where trees are a principal component are important for humankind and the health of this planet. That's what we hold in common. And uh, I think I continue to believe, and I think you do too, that tree dominated systems have local, national, and international objectives and linkages. Now, what's the difference? What have I heard of the difference, the similarities between reforestation and restoration? Well, both are answers, they're human focused, they're anthropocentric. Uh, they're responding to human scarcities in general. We hadn't talked about the needs of the, the animals and the other plants, but just for the nature of who we are, we're, we're going to look at our own scarcities first. Uh, both reforestation and restoration, they require patience and persistence. Even one of our speakers' names was patient. Uh, it's not a ca common characteristic of human beings to be patient or persistent. Um, both require active, adaptive, and sustainable management to achieve intended consequences. And then due to the long-term nature of tree development, uh, success relies on how human beings live together and govern themselves. Those sometimes can be very scarce resources. Um, and the other thing that's important, and we touched upon this in the seed bank uh, presentation, is having it's important to preserve future options for management, um, seed banking being the one example. Um, and then that's beyond our own generation, but the future generations. Uh, another commonality, they're both positive and negative externalities, both reforestation and restoration, restoration projects. Uh, many of the benefits and resources needed are public non-market goods, and are subject to market failures as defined in the economics literature. Now, let me talk about what's, what I think is different. Uh, many t the one thing is the initial state conditions. Restore, re reforestation starts, uh, restoration usually starts at a state condition where we're trying to restore to the back the way it was. And this, you could have a long discussion about what's the difference between preservation and in conservation, um, that's gone on for over 150 years in forestry and other aspects. Um, the other difference is what is the future state and objectives of both types of initiatives, reforestation or restoration. Um, reforestation can include agroforestry and agropastoral systems. Generally, restoration doesn't doesn't consider that. Um, 
And with a few possible exceptions, restoration excludes exotic species. You know, what are the, what are the uh, exceptions? It's where there are land races that exist uh, for a long period of time. I think Uganda is an example, Brazil is another one, where species that were introduced by human migration have become established in part of the social culture. And so in some cases you wanna restore um, uh, back to those land races um, to achieve objectives. And that is, uh, that's basically my wrap up. Christians, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, John, and I really appreciate your, your wrap up on this. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the public that has been still remaining on the webinar. We have almost been two hours in and uh, we still got a couple hundred people sign up. And uh, we're going to go ahead with the questions. So I'm going to take a little bit in here so I can spotlight all of the presenters. So I'm gonna please ask to the presenters if they can turn on their cameras and unmute themselves. I think I got the six of you here. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the first question that was pending. This question is for, for Tom Gary. We did got a lot of questions. So I'm gonna try to address as many as I can. And those that remain unanswered, uh, we will try to do our best to capture the question and have the panelists uh, answer it back since we got the email of most of you. Uh, Tom, this question, I don't recall who wrote it, who asked it, but is, is it still worth to get more trees planted? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I like planting trees myself, and I'm speaking mainly from, you know, the idea of carbon storage for the tree, and that's your principle. You're going to plant it. You got to make sure it's going to survive to the end of the century. That's pretty much the, the bottom line. Other, you know, there may be other things intervene and in, in new technologies, but that should be the plan. And that may be very hard to do. And you have to take the cost of the planting. That's the other. Um, that's why natural generation is like because tree planting exercises might actually burn up a lot of fossil fuel in the process of putting the tree in the ground, you know, big trucks and, uh, and so forth and so on, or even doing these machines of land to make them more easy to plant. So um, a tree planting is there's a lot of good reasons to plant trees, but if you're primarily doing it to the basis of carbon storage, uh, then, You've got to make do something to guarantee it. If you're maybe you should have to post a bond, which you have to do for a lot of contracting work. That there's going to be the tree is still going to be alive at the end of the project, otherwise, you forfeit the bond. Thank you very much. That is completely right, and, and very commonality among many other uh planting projects. And it was mentioned by many uh by many of the uh presenters that the lack of maintaining them is usually where many projects are, are currently failing, where they don't get the money or the budget to continue maintaining them. Reminds By me the way, I want to point out that uh, patients in Uganda said, mm -hmm. um, if you just want to read green, don't plant, just let nature take its course. Apparently they have in Uganda, the natural regeneration is quite successful for restoring the land. All right, all right. So I have a, one question for Jid Barrett. Uh, apologize, but I don't have who, who asked the question to mention it. Can you say which particular project characteristics are associated with one, vegetation cover, and two, 
with best likelihood gains. Say that again. The question is for Jeet Barrek. Oh. Can you say which particular project characteristics are associated with vegetation cover and with best livelihood gains? Uh, that is an institutionalization of communities. That is getting communities into institutions, formal institutions, and uh schemes that have uh, better livelihood opportunities had those uh, characteristics for uh, vegetation cover and livelihood and the other is the sustainability uh, plans of schemes that uh, projects or schemes are planning from the very beginning so those are the characteristics Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question in here from uh, Alejandro Cubiña from Puerto Rico. It seems it doesn't have to who the question is, so anybody that can address it, feel free to. It seems there's still there's still interest in funding tree planting in the tropics. How can we let funders know the importance of funding maintenance of what has been planted? If one or two or more of you want to address that, that's usually my main concern a lot of the times that I talk to partners. Well, yeah, I don't know how you guarantee survival. I mean, a lot of things, essentially it's a contract for a lot of tree planting. Uh, if you were in uh, many other things, contracting you, you know, building a new rail line or something, you would have, you might have to have a performance bond. I mean, that's, I don't know how that would apply to this area. So that if the project fails, well, people get their money back, <laughs> whatever it is. So, um, so I don't know how you guarantee, um, other than if local people really wanted to survive, that is probably the key for a local area. Although a lot of areas, if the news reports are right, the local people have no say, uh, the cattle, cattle then take it over. <laughs> They don't seem to be able to stop them. Right, right. Well, he, his, one question thing. Was, his question was actually about how do you let the funders know of the importance of maintenance? I can, uh, can take that, Christian. Yeah, somebody else can answer that, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm happy to take that. Um, you know, as part of my role currently at the World Resources Institute, we talk with funders all the time. And part of that is trying to teach them exactly what goes into the cost of a tree. I think there's many different understandings of what goes into a cost of a tree. Some people want to fund just the planting of the tree. You might see all those communications campaigns or things out there that are saying, oh, you can plant a tree for a dollar. You might be able to plant a tree for a dollar, but you're definitely not going to be able to maintain and monitor that tree over the five to 10 or 20 years, like what you had just said there, Tom, um, to do that. And so I think one thing is people who are looking for funding for any kind of restoration or reforestation projects need to be going to funders and being very clear about what that cost per tree is. And I can give you an example um, of what we're doing in two of our projects that I mentioned today. The first is the Prices Planet Coalition. That's a, a coalition that WRI works on with MasterCard as the core donor and with Conservation International. It's kind of a three-party system. And how the siting works is that there's very clear guidelines for what costs are included in that price per tree. So every single tree that goes in the ground has first off five years of monitoring from the second it's planted guaranteed as part of the cost as that tree. Each project submits monthly reports through a system that we have on one of our platforms called TerraMatch that enables us to see what the progress is like over time. And we tell projects that they need to budget for submitting those monthly reports for maintenance and monitoring for at least the next five years in their initial costs and their estimates to our donors. And we go to the donors and we say, there's no way that you can kind of skimp out on those costs because then you're not gonna be, you're not gonna guarantee what the actual implementation sustainability of that work. And it's also scary from a perspective of a funder because they don't want their trees to die. You know, that's a really bad PR look for them. It makes it seem like they're funding work that doesn't actually have an impact. And so if you're lucky to work with funders who actually have 
the real outcomes at the heart of the siting proposal and of the restoration work, that it makes that a lot easier. Um, the other thing too, I think, is putting it on the projects to actually identify what those costs are. There's a lot of bad assumptions out there that people say, oh, yep, tree planting costs $1 a tree. And then they ask projects to fit within that framework. So they say, great, my, I'm not gonna do any work with you unless you do it for a dollar per tree, right? That means that projects, because they need the money to pay their staff or to continue the projects that they're doing, like you just said they're Christian, then will do anything that they possibly can to skimp on those costs, try and get the money for a dollar per tree, and then that makes the project's implementation riskier for everyone involved, for the projects, for the funders, for any intermediary agencies, and it can lead to embarrassment for everyone along the way. And so one thing that we've been trying to do is saying the opposite. We're working with funders that have a certain amount of money. They're saying, okay, great. Well, we have $15 million. We have $20 million. We have $1 million. Um, we want to do the most that we can in an ecologically and socially responsible way with that money. And so then we'll go and we'll talk to projects like through a request for proposals process. And we'll say, you know, what can you do? If you, you should give us a proposal. If that means for you that that's $3 a tree, that includes five years of monitoring, that includes maintenance of all of these things, that includes heavy community mobilization, building seed banks or whatever we just talked about, that's up to you to put that in your cost per tree and then we will discuss it together. And during the negotiations, you know, a lot of people are always going for the maximum amount that they possibly can. That's when you have that frank conversation with the project about what are the actual costs that go into this? How can we tra be transparent about that to funders? Because at the end of the day, if we're not transparent about it and we're not telling funders how it is on the ground, they're going to continue to make the same mistakes again and again, and we're going to read the same articles in the media we've all been reading the last 10 years. Um, so I think it's, a, it's on to organizations who are kind of at the center of that, including I'm sure many people who are on this call, um, to be frank and honest with funders, to not skimp out on those budgets and to make sure that the true cost of growing a tree is there. And the last thing I'll say is, I think there needs to be a lot more research done on what that true cost per tree is. Um, I know that there's a lot that's going on. Robin Chasden, who I know is on this call, and others who are working with the TEER initiative are trying to get a sense of how much it costs to actually plant and grow, maintain, and monitor a tree. And so the more transparency you can build into budgeting will be really important. So that's what I would say to that. Excellent. Thank you very much. One, one more thing that I wanted to point out is that in many projects that we evaluate, most project proponents do not take into account the numbers of dollars that it costs to have volunteers. And, and that's why in many cases, trees cost so few dollars to plant because the maintenance is not accounted for or the labor that the volunteers do for projects, it is not taken into consideration in many cases. And it does adds a lot to the project. And thanks to that is how trees are growing in many projects. So I have a question here for, uh, for patients. I am curious to see, and this came from uh, Pe Perimenta. I am curious to see what species grow in association with eucalyptus. Patients mentioned the Mysopis species, but we know eucalyptus to have serious allelopathic properties that prevent any other trees to grow in association with eucalyptus. Have you had several varieties of trees in association with eucalyptus or only Mysopis? my subsidies and what is the performance so far? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I am just trying out the my subsidies eucalyptus combination, but uh, there was eucalyptus already on that woodlot, which I harvested in January. And my subsidies trees regenerated naturally. So there are trees which are about between one and five years. There are other tree species, but I am not sure of what use they would be. So I'm not leaving them in. So I'm only leaving my sopsis and eucalyptus. And I'm starting it this year. So probably eight years from now, I'll be able to share a better experience. But I think it's going to work because these, the ones that are there, the my sopsis trees, which are between one and five years old, regenerated naturally when there was mature eucalyptus in that woodlot. So I believe that they, they, will, they, they will survive. So I, I, I'm just trying it out and I hope it will work. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question here for Jill. Uh, 
the, the, the question came from David Lloyd. What is the estimated cost of a simple seed banking facility proposed by Jill? Thank you. Um, I, I think the, the, the kind of seed bank that I'm running is, um, the, is like a restoration seed bank, a working seed bank, and is not a, a black box facility, a large research institution. So it's, it's a lot simpler seed bank. And that seed bank, um, I think the cost to build that is about um, $150,000. Um, with these, including the solar system, as well as the equipment that is needed to run the seed bank. So that kind of gives you um, a sense of, of what that costs. I think Terraformation also sells a um, DYI kit uh, instructions um, for about $5,000 so people can build their own seed bank and use those instructions and, and pay for consulting for guidance to build as well. And some people do that. And so there's a few options. I think the main thing to remember about seed banking is what's really critical is the temperature and the relative humidity. Seeds are very, the longevity of seeds is, is affected by the temperature and relative humidity. So the beauty of doing creating a seed bank out of a 40 foot shipping container is that it's a box, it's a metal box, and that can be climate controlled very easily. And what that does is it allows people to, um, to dry large quantities of seeds in the, in the entire space. So instead of drying in, in, in expensive equipment, drying boxes and, and things like that, you can actually use the whole space to dry and you can use drying racks. And if you have any questions about that, um, please feel free to contact me, our um, Terraformation, thank you. Yes, I can help address that question, but uh, I'm gonna leave that to you, but I'll, 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 uh, I'm available to talk to any of you about that topic if you're interested in, in learning more. And by the way, my email is christian at terraformation.com. Uh, the other emails of your other participants are all available on the website from ISTF that you receive it when you register. There's a link in there. And we will make sure that we share the contacts of everybody because we do have a lot of questions in here. Uh, I'm going to pass on this question to Will Anderson. Uh, we are doing to no. Sorry, I'm not sure if that question was already addressed. Uh, the question came from Robin Chasdon. This is fascinating. We'll love some takeaways regarding your views of the capacity and knowledge needs that you are encountered, particularly among the developing groups, but also in the rising and developing groups. We can have a separate discussion, but if you can uh, talk a little bit about that, that would be great. I'm happy to, and hi, Robin. Um, one thing that we've done is that we've looked at these 3,200 you know, applications, and my two colleagues, Claire and Isabel at WRI are leading that analysis, not myself, so I'm just kind of parroting what they've told me. But um, what's been the biggest surprising thing for us is there's a lot of those locally led organizations that know a lot about the ecological. So a lot of these organizations are really locally led. They understand which trees are indigenous to the areas. They're really good on community engagement. They know the traditional leaders. They know the government officials. They are heavily embedded in communities. They don't do anything that doesn't align directly with the goals that communities have for restoration or reforestation in that area. And that was a pleasant surprise to me because uh, there's a lot more people that know a lot about running a good organization than running a successful restoration project. Those skills are a lot rarer in the world than someone who knows how to you know, do accounting. And the biggest capacity gap that we found, which I think is both surprising and also shows that we might need technical assistance in a different kind of capacity than we might traditionally think about it in technical assistance, was on the organizational capacity side. A lot of these organizations have really poor accounting practices. They don't audit their books. They have no idea how to write a budget. They're poor at communicating their impact. Um, they don't have access to any kinds of systems that funders need in order to justify 
their investment. They might not even be able to accept you know, loans or, or grants from foreign organizations. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing the last couple of years in the entrepreneur and nonprofit side is trying to strengthen the capacity of these organizations to absorb finance, to communicate about that, and to have, you know, best practices. And even some of the organizations that you might have heard of, you know, they struggle with this because a lot of them are nature people. They're people that know a lot about trees, they know a lot about communities too, and they might be from those areas but they struggle on kind of the things that you might learn in like business school or like an accounting class. Um, and so that's the biggest surprise that we found. And that for me is a very heartening challenge because I think that there's a lot of people that can address that. Um, and so that would be my call to action for kind of people on this call too, is to you know reach out and try and understand kind of what the capacity needs are, not just on the technical side for restoration, but also on the side of running high quality organizations, um, which as we, I think many of us know is really difficult. Um, I'm not a forester myself. I focus more on the kind of, you know, technical like capacity, organizational challenges and finance portion. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say, Christian. Thank you, Will. And now I have a question for you here. Uh, somebody in the group is wondering uh, if you take into consideration uh, other ecosystem services or like biodiversity and species conservation and pollinators, for example, as part of your standards that you have developed. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, and in our standard, in the section of uh, implementation, we have several indicators. We address some environmental issues. Uh, the, the, the work with pollinators and the selection of the species are, of course, one part of this, uh, of the standard. Uh, in general, the standard is very focused in the, the in the address and recovery of the at the end of all the ecosystem services of the of the of the ecosystem, uh, biodiversity, water, um, soil conservation, etc. So yeah, the idea of the standard is uh, develop the mostly important uh, indicators and the ecosystem the, the ecosystem services is one of the the main goals of the of the summit. Excellent. Thank you very much. A uh, question for Tom from from Daniel Debra in from ISTF in Ghana. He has a specific question on uh, on which specific reforestation is an ideal to pursue in tropical Africa, because there has been several massive landscape restoration. Well, I think I answered that in the question and answer column, but I said um, he, he might have. I haven't been. I haven't been to, haven't been to Ghana recently or any time, so I can't, you know, have a good knowledge of their forest or what's going there. Um, but I would say that people on the ground should be able to, if they can get around, can see what's happened, what kind of plantings have gone on, and and see for themselves if, in fact, it's being successful. And is it surviving? Um, so I, I mean, I think this is you know, really a local decision as to what is really working in your area. Right. Uh, I'm going to pass you on another question that came from Ashish Alex. We are encouraging more bioproducts for future. How do you think we can balance preservation of current trees and those goals? Balance, say that again. Uh, we are encouraging more bioproducts for future. Do you think we can, how do you think we can balance preservation of current trees and these goals? I guess the goals are related to production of bioproducts in the future. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, one of the things that comes up is you're trying to preserve ecosystems. So, um, I mean, that, if it's possible to do work, can you get it back what you want? And why do you want to have the you know, thing exactly like it was in the past? And that's usually to preserve species and generally um, other, other organisms. Yeah. But um, if, or you just want to get it back because you don't want barren land because it's going to erode or have other problems. So, 
I guess you have to, I mean, you really have to decide what is your real purpose for doing this planting? I mean, that's, and then, so that, I think that's the first thing. You really gotta be clear about why you're doing this. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, I got several questions in here that came for Jill. And some were addressed, but not everybody on the group saw them. Many tree species have seed that do not have dormancy and must germinate after they're ripe or else they die. How can they be banked? Okay, that question is referring to um, the storage capacity of seeds. And there are generally two types of seeds. There are orthodox seed, and those are seeds which can be dried and stored. And there are recalcitrant seeds. As I said, seeds that need to remain wet. And so, um, and they can't be dried and, and stored. And so I think that um, we have to focus on the orthodox seed. There are ways to store recalcitrant seed and the larger institutions have the technology um, to do that. It's called cryopreservation. But for most of the projects in the world that are working in the tropics and the temperate regions on these reforestation <coughs> projects, there's a huge number of orthodox seed that can be stored and are not being stored. And that is clearly apparent by the number of seed banks in the world, which are only about 400. And there are, are a, there's a need for 100,000 seed banks to, to match and support the restoration potential um, that is needed in the world. So I'll stop there. And I think Sheila has a comment she wants to make. Yeah, go on, Sheila. Yes, um, patience uh, is running out of data. So a question to her again would be good. I think she could answer to the question also that went to Tom on um, deciding what to plant based on the um, final purpose of the planting for the restoration or reforestation. Um, so I was wondering if patients could just say a word on that before um, she runs out of data. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I believe that uh, we need to follow the standards that have been set in tree planting or tree growing. Uh, one of the best practices is doing a soil analysis. With a soil analysis, I believe you'll be able to establish what tree species would be ideal for that location that you want to grow trees in. Um, as I said in my presentation, I'm one of the guilty ones. I don't do soil analysis. And I think it has to do with the cost. If that cost of soil analysis could be brought down, I believe many tree plant farmers would gladly invest in that. It would be part of your cost of tree growing. Then the second thing is that, uh, as the Will said earlier, that many people look at the cost of just planting the tree. They forget about the cost of maintaining the tree. And the first two years are the most expensive before the tree has established itself. They're the most expensive because you have to weed, you have to slash, you have to keep animals out of that area. Uh, there are many things you have to do to make sure that those trees survive. Now, many donors tend to fund the putting the tree into the ground. And very few are willing to fund the additional first, second, third year of the tree. Now, that is the most expensive part. If you don't have the resources to actually maintain the tree in the ground, then it is pointless to plant. You just might as well let natural regeneration take its course. But if you want to plant and get a product at the end of it, then you have to invest in the first two or three years. As you get to the fourth, fifth, sixth year, the costs will go down because the tree will now have established itself and uh, the care that is needed will be less. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's what I would like to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, patient. I'm gonna go ahead and, and um, pass you on another question from another participant. If there has been any studies 
or based on experience, do eucalyptus species have a significant or substantial socioeconomic contribution than indigenous species across the local communities? Um, I have not seen any study where someone compares uh, the socioeconomic benefits of eucalyptus with any other tree species. So I would not uh, comment on that. But what I can say is that uh, there is good income from tree growing. Now the species you will select will depend on your local conditions uh, uh, or what you want to, what you want to achieve as a tree farmer. Are you growing the trees uh, for timber? Are you growing the trees for fencing posts, uh, uh, transmission poles? Why are you growing those trees? That I believe would be the determinant for, for one to decide which species they are going to plant. Um, again, as I said, I haven't seen any studies that compares eucalyptus with an indigenous species. So I would not make any comment on that. But generally speaking, uh, we need the trees. We need the trees for our timber. Most of our furniture, <clears throat> at least here in Africa, most of our furniture is from wood. Uh, we need the trees for firewood. Uh, most people, uh, most, most Africans cook their food on, on wood. So we need the trees for firewood. So uh, even growing trees for firewood is ideal because uh, it is not, it is, it is expensive in terms of one's time to go and just look for firewood in a forest. It is cheaper for the firewood to come from your wood lot. And it is even safer because we have heard of stories of people going to collect firewood and they, the women get raped, the children get beaten. I even many years ago when I had just started working, uh, we visited a certain area in Southwestern Uganda and we found this child, uh, this mother told us about this child whose hand has been chopped. And the hand had been chopped because he went to collect firewood in somebody else's woodlot. So those kind of things will not happen if you have your own woodlot where you're going to be able to collect your firewood for cooking. So depending on what you need the wood for, it is important to have those trees. Then of course, there is the, <clears throat> there is the issue of, of of uh, carbon sinks. We need the green areas to absorb the carbon dioxide that we produce. We are the ones who are producing the carbon dioxide, so we need to deal with it. And dealing with it is the, the cheapest way to deal with carbon dioxide. I know there are other expensive ways, but the cheapest way to deal with the carbon dioxide in our environment is to plant trees. Thank you. Question, you're muted. Sorry about that. I'm going to follow up on a carbon topic, on a carbon question that came from Nick Hover. I'm going to pass on that question to Hernan. Do you see the voluntarily carbon market? Example, better carbon credit that US and European Union companies buy to meet a zero goal on avoidable emissions as a potential funding source for reforestation projects? Thank you for the for the question and the answer is yes. Uh, actually, one of the most, uh, in, in the last year, the most of the, of the funders, uh, we are looking to, or we approach to us to look in some advice or the use of the standard are carbon, uh, carbon funders. They, they see uh, that the restoration activities in general, not only the reforestation, it, that's one of the important Techniques to use to address the for for the carbon markets. Uh, right now, we are working uh, in, in some collaboration with Berna for the BCS uh, standards to see how we can approach or use our standard to to these kind of projects. Um, the, the short question is yes, we see a, a lot of potential to to this uh, market, uh, these funds coming from the carbon market to, to help to the restoration projects at the field level, yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. 
Uh, I have a question from uh, Dair Yusuf, and I'm going to direct this one to Jit Barrek. I can see that you are involved in East African countries such as Ethiopia and Uganda. Do you have any projects or know of anyone in Somalia who is involved in restoration of trees? Well, I uh, already responded for this uh, over uh, writing, but uh, I really do not know anyone in Somalia, but uh, somehow I can indicate uh, I can search this through if they can contact me through uh, Society for Ecological Restoration as I'm a board member for the African chapter. Excellent. I'm going to pass you on another question here from uh, maybe you have answered it earlier. Yeah. Scheme managers overestimate achievements as part of reporting to their donors and governments, but community response based on, part, on practical gains in terms of their livelihood. That might have been your question. I'm sorry, I didn't read the- That's my response actually. So what was it? The question it was uh, from Mohamed Abdu. Yeah. Why the rest, the result difference occur between scheme manage, managers and beneficiaries? Yeah, I mean, technically project managers uh, or program managers uh, generally tend to overestimate their achievements. So this is an obvious thing that we are seeing in any other project or program. So, uh, but communities speak from their experience and from what they have achieved in those uh, projects. So for instance, livelihoods, uh, communities say, this is what change I have achieved from this project. And this is a change I've gotten, but uh, the project owners or the implementers tend to overestimate those for reporting sake, for government reporting or donor reporting. So that's why we see. Thank you very much. Uh, one question here came from Christina Urrutia for Jill Wagner. How will seed banking interact with the with the potential for natural regeneration? I believe that both natural regeneration and seed banking are very, very important. And natural regeneration can happen successfully in areas that are protected. And, um, and it, it works, it doesn't work well everywhere because in the tropics, um, sometimes invasive species, if they're occurring in the area, will take over before the native species. So you might not achieve what you're trying to achieve. And you have to do some helping even with natural regeneration. And so, um, but it's a very, it's a very good way to, to rebuild forests by protecting um, and, you know, setting aside areas that can naturally regenerate it. That doesn't happen as quickly sometimes as planting. And so I feel that we are so late in this work that we're supposed to be doing to reforest the planet and to keep the planet healthy that we need to use all the tools that we have. And seed banking is one active restoration. There are other things like broadcasting of seed. So all of these things um, can be beneficial and should be ad addressed. And seed banking is really at the heart of a lot of this. And um, in terms of, of looking at how much seed to collect, that's based on the area that you're working in and what is available for, for collection in terms of um, forest sites. Excellent response. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question here from Robin Chardon, Chasdon for Will. Do you see a decline in quality? Will increase in scale? How do you ensure attention to detail and to local engagement with increasing scale and set of deliverable to donors and funders? Thanks for the question, Robin. Um, I think this is a really important question. One of our goals, like I had said, is to bring more organizations up the pipeline so that they can receive more funding, restore more land, grow more trees over time. 
um, but without sacrificing the quality that comes from locally led restoration projects. And I think there's a couple examples I can give about how organizations have done that effectively. One example is, which I talked a little bit in my presentation, is Wells for Zoe, which is a locally led organization in that works in Malawi in East Africa. Um, they started as a small kind of charity. They worked with a small number of communities over time. They built their own nurseries. They've dug up dozens of wells in this one part of Malawi. And over time, they figured out they had two options. Option one was that they could basically just replicate exactly what they were doing and other communities just kind of, they worked in this community. So of course it's gonna work in this other community. What they did instead is that they worked and tried to identify the needs of each place that they were looking to expand for before they asked for funding. So for example, they'll go into one community that's near the other one and say, hey, I know you've heard about this restoration project that's happening in this one part of Malawi. Um, we're running that with our partners there. Um, here's what we can bring to the table. Does that align with what you want to bring to the table? What additionally could we do in order to do that? And then they'll translate that into their funding proposals. So they're not going to take the same cookie cutter approach for each individual project that they run as part of their initiative, which is something that I found to be very powerful because one hallmark of, I think, a failed of what you say is, I think a, a bunch of us had talked about this earlier, when we're looking for speed, which is very important, sometimes we can, which because of the climate crisis, because of the fact that there's a lot of degraded land around the world that deserves restoration and that communities want it. I think when we do speed at the sacrifice too much of quality, then it leads to poor outcomes for everyone. But at the same time, we can't sacrifice speed. And I think that's extremely important. And that's why I'm, I'm you know, inspired by Jill's work and Terraformation's work on these mobile seed banks, for example, because you're trying to balance like in, in a piece of infrastructure and an approach that is adaptable to each individual location. And I think the more that we think about scale in that sense, I think the better off that will be. Um, and I think the other thing that's, that's helpful in these kind of things too is that you can do kind of top-down restoration projects and that works in some areas where there's not a lot of community members or where there's strong government influence and where it does make a lot of sense to think about it a little bit more top-down often that's basically where people don't live um, and usually natural regeneration or assisted natural regeneration is the right approach to take there um, but in places where there are a lot of people where the pressures on the land are very strong there needs to be a locally led solution to that and so as organizations increase, they can't lose the locally led aspects of the solutions and implementation. What is helpful is when you have a really strong group of core people who are kind of coordinating and representing this, these different locally led initiatives under a common umbrella. And another example I'll give briefly is um, an organization called Global Forest Generation. Um, they're an organization that works with local partners throughout the, the Andes. And what they've done, which I think is really inspiring, is they've taken this indigenous-led restoration movement that needed funding, that needed support on the kind of funding absorption like aspects, it needed support on communications. They took the goals of those communities and then try to get them funding by bringing them under this larger umbrella that could actually absorb finance. And they've scaled up to several million trees a year without sacrificing any of the locally led aspects of that organization. And they've been able to, I think they work in 12 countries now and with more than 30 local partners, but under this kind of common umbrella that has you know, quality and speed at its core. So I think like balancing that is very difficult, but when you do find the organizations that are able to do that effectively, I think that's an easy sell for funders as well because they wanna work with good organizations, but they also want efficiency. And granting to 100 individual organizations for a funder is really, really difficult and not very efficient when it comes to flow of funds. So trying to figure out how you balance that is um, important. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, one question from Daniel Debra for Tom. How can we meet ecosystem restoration targets by 20, 2030 by advocating for nature to take its course without planting later? successional species. I think you're muted. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Pushing the wrong button. Um, well, some trees grow fast. We know the eucalyptus tree grows fast, but that may be not very appropriate for a lot of people. Um, trees do take a long time to grow normally. Um, there's the old factor of 
maximizing basal area growth. And then the forest kind of reaches its maximum basal area. Some set of forestry basic I remembered. And that may take a very long time. It may take you know, 20, 30 years. Some places it may take 80 years or more. So I don't think planting a tree now is going to do a lot about getting carbon out of the air by 2030. I mean, it's, it's going to make a little increment, but it's not. It's going to be you know, 30 or 40 down, years down the road before you really start getting your maximum. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to pose a question in here to patients. Uh, it's a comment and a question. Uh, understanding on both aspects of socioeconomic and ecological impacts of eucalyptus invasion can greatly assist in decision making and management of the species where, where there is a socioeconomical conflict of whether to maintain or eradicate species kind. So despite the socioeconomic distribution of eucalyptus species are the communities in Uganda, even generalizing Africa as a whole, have more no knowledge or ecological impacts of the eucalyptus species? And what is their overall perception or reaction in terms of practice and attitudes relative to land restoration? Thank you for that question. I read that question and I was shy to type a response. Um, because it is a loaded question. There's issues to do with social economic benefits. There's trying to scale it up to all Africa. And yet Africa is really diverse. You cannot scale up anything. Even just Uganda is very diverse. So for instance, the comment I made about uh, leaving an area to, to regenerate naturally may not work in the Northeastern areas of Uganda where it is very dry. So um, I would have, I would be shy to scale up anything across Africa even. Uh, but uh, eucalyptus has proved itself to be a money maker. So people are making money in Uganda with eucalyptus. Uh, timber yards are full of eucalyptus. So we are going to grow it. Uh, the thing is that, uh, because we are planting it, we can choose where we plant it. It is not regenerating naturally. So it's not becoming an invasive species. An invasive species is one that after you have introduced it, then it naturally spreads all over. But with eucalyptus, it is you who decides that you're going to plant it in area X and it will grow in area X. Yes, if the seeds fall, they might, they might germinate, but they don't, you don't get a tree out of that. They eventually die out. Now, this may not happen to other introduced species. Other introduced, like the other example I mentioned about water hyacinth. Water hyacinth became a really, really big problem in this country. Uh, fishermen were not able to, to land their fish at certain landing sites. Even electricity generation became a problem because the water hyacinth went and blocked the, what, the dam. So some invasive species, some species can become invasive and some may not. So when introducing a species, I think one needs to study it carefully before they actually introduce. I do not blame those who brought eucalyptus into Uganda a century ago because it was fast growing tree species and it was, it coppiced very well and it produced good firewood and they wanted firewood for urban growing, for, for the growing urban centers. So it was ideal, but it was based on the limited knowledge that the decision was based on the limited knowledge that they had at that time. Now, today, we have a lot more knowledge about our different tree species. So before you actually introduce a tree species in any ecosystem whatsoever, study it very well and make sure that you eliminate any possibility of that species becoming invasive. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to you, uh, patients. 
Uh, I'm going to post another question in here for Hernan. What are examples of good community engagement to promote restoration or reforestation? Can repeat, please? What are good examples of community engagement to promote restoration and reforestation? Well, tricky question. <laughs> yeah, we, we see a lot of, of involvement of the community in the, in, in the, in the restoration. Um, and always they have a, a very good approach in the in focus it in the restoration in the, in the involvement of their own community in the restoration probably uh, well I see a very good approach in that is when this um, good well well good uh, good involvement can be reached with the uh, support of technical of technical support about the restoration uh, we see everybody in the community have the good will to, to do the, the work in, in the best way possible. But in some cases, uh, they don't have the, the, the sufficient technical advice. So in some cases where when the stakeholders uh, provide this technical support to the to the communities, they have a very they have better results and uh, in the involvement and they have better results in the restoration approach and the restoration projects in the general. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to pose a question in here for Jitba, Jitba Rek. What are the best indicators? I'm, I'm sorry, the question came from Dr. Nick Brocco from Puerto Rico. What are the best indicators of good governance for reforestation? Yeah, so uh, the at least in the study areas uh, in our study project is the best indicators we found were uh, communities involvement in terms of livelihood benefit. So project is that uh, involved uh, communities livelihood improvement rather than simply planting schemes uh, were found to be uh, the ones with uh, the, a good governance indicator. And the other one is projects that have uh, sustainability plans and practices as well which are uh, legitimized by communities themselves. So uh, those are the best indicators, at least in our project case, that have been found as an indicator. Thank you very much. Uh, question from Eder Audey for Gio. Uh, he uh, He's from the Republic of Haiti. He's the Director of Forest and Renewable Energies of the Ministry of Environment of Haiti. First of all, I would like to congratulate all the in initiators of this program on tropical reforestation and restoration. My concern goes directly of the viability of seeds in relation to the effects of climate change. What do you think on this subject? And, and follow up question. The other concern is in relation to the native species available to combat the effect of climate change and meet the demands of the moment, such as economic, cultural, and environmental, and wood for energy. Yes, I think um, that is really the sort of the, the main point of my, what I wanted to share is that we, we have to do this work now and the seed banking, that we need to do in the seed collection really should should be um, done very very purposefully at this point in time because um, climate change, as I mentioned in my talk, is is shifting. The climate disruption is shifting the weather patterns and the reliability of pollination and of seed production, and we don't know where we're gonna be in 20 years and how that seed production is gonna be. And I don't think it's responsible for our generation to not be collecting seeds while we have the opportunity to do so now. I think that if we really want to be responsible and look ahead, we need to do this work while we can because we don't know what we're gonna to hand to the next generation, both in terms of ecosystems and in individual species and the availability of those founders. 
And I talked about that in terms of giving an example of fire. Even if, even if there is some natural regeneration of, of tree species after a fire, think about how a tree, it typically takes at least seven years to begin seeding. If these fires are happening over and over, those young seedlings are not gonna be able to make it to maturity. We've really got a problem. We're not collecting from the founders that we have, the mother trees that we have on the earth today. And that's where we need to focus our attention. And that's why I also highlighted the state of the world's trees paper by BGCI, because this is <clears throat> really what we need to do in order to leave the next generation with the resources that they need to, to continue to work, to do work to protect the planet. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, this is a question that I'm pretty sure it has a very long answer because I, I, I know the region. It came from Hugo Soberanis uh, and it's for Will Anderson. Can you give some examples of potential projects in Central America? Sure, I can give one example right now of a project that we're working with um, in Guatemala. And actually my colleague is flying to it on Sunday. Um, my colleague Renee Zamora, who's from, who's from Guatemala himself. Um, and this project is run by Fede Covera, which is an association of cooperatives um, that works in Guatemala. They are a incredible organization. How it works actually, similar to how I was talking earlier about how there's kind of like an umbrella organization that empowers local action that's locally specific. So it's a federation of I think 42 or 43 cooperatives that are led by farmers of one of the indigenous communities in Guatemala. Um, and what they do is they do a wide variety of projects that are related to sustainable forestry, agriculture, restoration, reforestation. What they do is they go to each cooperative, they ask them, what do you want to do with your land? What are your goals? How can we help you do that in the most sustainable economically and environmentally way possible? And so as part of the project that we had been designing with them um, as part of this Priceless Planet Coalition with MasterCard, we empowered Fedeco Vera to go talk to the communities. We said, you know, MasterCard is interested in funding projects that have a high biodiversity and climate impact. They want communities, but they don't want timber as part of their funding portfolio. Um, that we're very clear about that. And so Federico Vera, rather than saying, okay, all the cooperatives have to do exactly what's in this funding proposal, they went to each individual cooperative and they said, do you want to be a part of this? Do you want to be a part of this? How would you want to design your project around this? How can we help you scale up your native tree nursery using this money? Because a lot of them had been planting really high value timber species or you know, exotic species that were really important for the economic parts that, that patients had just talked about. Um, and a lot of the cooperatives came on board and they said, yes, uh, we'd love to be a part of this. One of the cooperatives said, actually, you know, this project, not something we wanna be a part of right now because we don't feel like we can, it doesn't match our, our goals for our part of our cooperative in this part of the, the landscape. And I thought that was a really great transparent way of designing a project like this because they were able to take the money, funnel it to the people who wanted it, able to design the project so it met both the needs of the community and the need of the funder, and didn't punish the cooperative that didn't want to be a part of the project because it's their land and it's their you know goals that they have. Um, so that's one example. And I, if you're interested in learning more about some really great examples in, of projects going on throughout Latin America and Central America and specifically, I'd, I'd recommend you go to the website of initiative20by20.org. Um, that has about 60 examples of restoration projects, both from the small scale and the large scale. Um, and to what patients is said, the last thing I want to reflect on is um, this question over land and diversity. And another call for kind of the reason why we need to approach this from a local perspective. Um, one stat I came across recently in some research was that 75% of land, give or take, in Africa is um, owned or managed directly by communities. It depends on the country, of course, but that's really important. In Latin America, there's a lot more kind of larger pieces of land that are available for reforestation or other kind of restoration projects. And so you can't take the same approach for designing restoration projects and reforestation projects if you have a large, if the land ownership or land tenure is different in these areas. So, you know, we've learned that as well as we've been like engaging with project developers, entrepreneurs and government officials through that, um, which has been exciting. And the last thing I'll say actually, that's really interesting and something that I think we need to think about finance and I didn't touch on with this, is the fact that governments have incentive programs for 
reforestation and restoration work. They'll pay farmers to plant trees. And my colleague Renee Zamora did an analysis that showed that there's several programs in countries like Guatemala, um, Chile, Mexico that actually pay farmers a certain amount to subsidize the cost of their tree and for the maintenance over time. And so tweaking those programs so that they have the same best practices that we had discussed is really helpful because then you can scale up that, you make use of the government's funding and then also match that funding with funding from the private sector or from um, development cooperation like you know donor governments or whatever to kind of make up for that total cost per tree. You know, sometimes funders can't do five to ten dollars per tree, depending on what it is, but maybe three funders can come together and they can do the five to ten dollars per tree, as long as they're not, of course, interested in claiming that tree for a carbon credit, because then it gets complicated. But um, I think the more creative we can be in order to get the finance that's necessary, the better it is. And I think that there's been several really good examples, like the Feta Cobera example of projects that have been able to access these different pools of funding and empower local communities to do really good work that they themselves want to do. Thank you very much, Will. And the conversation is very is going very interesting and we still got questions to go, but we only got about eight more minutes. So I'm going to pose a question without tagging any of you. Maybe one or two more people can talk about it. It came from Elizabeth Moore. Thank you for the symposium. This question is for anyone who presented. I am interested in learning what you see as the biggest one or two training or capacity building needs for organization, for community members, for governments, et cetera, in the work that we do in this area. I will leave that question open to anyone. Yeah, I can start with it and probably some, someone else has another self. But um, I'd like to mention one of the things we need to improve all of the of we are involved in, in the restoration projects is the training and capacity building in a monitoring issues in the about the restorations. Uh, like we see we we have the problem that a lot of projects with only put trees in the in the field and at the end, we don't have what happened with the with the with the tree in uh, five years, ten years. So I think we need to improve our monitoring knowledge uh, in the restoration in the restoration projects. Uh, I think it's one of the one of two one of two of the most important things we need to improve and in this part of the restoration. Yeah, somebody else want to add more to that? Maybe I can go. Uh, so I've been, uh, we have been soliciting this capacity building needs for uh, governments, uh, especially uh, forest uh, sector leaders. So one of the issue, the capacity needs that we have found in terms of restoration for governments would be like uh, giving them uh, case specific restoration mechanisms where one of the issues that were raised that is like contextually uh, sufficing uh, specific restoration mechanisms. And the other is uh, how to get this restoration mechanisms with uh, livelihood uh, opportunities around the communities. In terms of uh, community capacity building, we identified uh, uh, one issue to be how communities can organize themselves into organizations to restore uh, their own landscape. So that is like communities uh, being organized as NGOs, to get fundings and to restore their own uh, organization and restore their own landscape. So that's those two are the capacity building needs that we have identified. Excellent, thank you very much. If anybody else wants to add more to, to this question, I'm afraid just... that if we post another question, we're gonna go over time. So I'm gonna keep on this one. I would just reinforce what I said earlier about the need to build really strong organizations um, that can do restoration work on the ground and do it in a professional way. I think that's the biggest gap 
that I'm seeing in, in the people that I've been talking to. Um, and a lot of it is just giving a lot of really ambitious young people from local organizations around the world professional development opportunities at a scale that actually will help us achieve that problem so we can help make their dreams a reality. Um, and I think there's a lot of demand for that. And so the more that all of us on this call and others can do to give those kind of people opportunities, the more, the better we'll be off five years from now. Um, I wanted to, to say that um, in terms of training opportunities, um, my company um, provides training opportunities um, for projects and the, the, the entire restoration cycle. And um, I know Terraformation also has Terraformation Academy and provides training as well. So I think we need to keep building these training opportunities and help people to really think about the entire process of restoration and look at what they need to do to get to a, a, a level that's professional and then can scale. So that those are my I wanted to mention of my own personal experience. I work for Terraformation where we have several courses in Terraformation Academy, one on seed banking, the other one on nursery management that was actually developed by Jill and another more on seed collection and seed, seed bank maintenance. But we came across a list of other courses by FAO on restoration. And it looks like one institution, you know, puts a little bit of the grain of salt in here and the other institution adds a little more to it. But because when you see, it seems like all of the trainings need to be some kind of way. I wish I can take them all if my time will allow it. But there are certain trainings that are focusing on nurseries, but they forget the seeds or they forget how you maintain the trees. So you need to complement a lot of this training, you know, and it's like going to an academy where you take several courses on, on different areas that you start from, you know, from beginners, and then you go to a more advanced, like a seed banking, for example, you know, and then you understand a little bit better on how you're going to manage it. And one important thing that I see missing in many nonprofits that I have worked with them in the past is to incorporate volunteers because it is not easy to manage volunteers. It is not easy to manage how do you account for their time, but your finance people are going to be after you so you can report on the time the volunteers donated. And it's very important to know how to manage them. Volunteers will serve in many ways for your projects and, and you need to also consider your volunteers for training, not only train your staff, but consider training your volunteers, your community members, and other people that are involved on your project. Because a lot of the times they will get a really big smile when they go for a free webinar that you invited them. Let's say you host it in a big TV screen or something like that, and you invite your volunteers. Just always keep that in mind because you know they're very important key, key components of your projects. And labor is being very scarce for many of these projects and we have to count on volunteers. So uh, they are, they're a very important part. And, and I'm gonna close out uh, the discussion with this. Uh, I'm very thankful for all the team. Uh, it wasn't only me that put this together, but we had a team of people at Terra Formation is uh, Margaret Mor uh, Morales and Aubrey Vela and Chris Yorka who helped it, you know, on the background, getting all the questions answered and getting all the, you know, minor glitches in here, how to fix them in, in, in the webinar. And we also have Sheila Ward who helped greatly help put all this together uh, in the ISTF and, and the other team of people that are the members of the International Forestry Working Group at the Society of American Forester, uh, which is Tom and Kandra, um, Sheila as well, and, and Bob Sturtevant and John Walker. I wanna thank, thank them as well for their help uh, getting this together. We have been planning the webinar for several months already, have several conversations, and we certainly hope that we can have a future one. Uh, we had a couple hundred participants coming and going, and I'm very glad, uh, uh, thankful to those that stay to the end. And be sure that we're gonna, we have all the presentations already recorded. So they are gonna be shared in the websites of uh, the International Society of Tropical Foresters and in the YouTube channel. And we'll likely uh, send a link to all those via email. So I will appreciate, and if anybody have any questions, thoughts, recommendations. My email is Christian, uh, C-H-R-I 
S T I A N at terraformation.com. And we will try to do our best to address some of the unanswered questions because I was really glad that we got so many, but time was not enough. And uh, we will try to figure out, uh, uh, you know, the way around it to how to get your questions to the panelists and your contact information to follow up. So thank you very much. On behalf of the three entities sponsoring the event, the International Society of Tropical Forester, Terraformation, and the Society of, of American Foresters, I want to thank everybody and the panelists for being here and for putting all this together. And uh, have a great day, night, evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Aloha. Bye-bye.